You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million on my head. I'm a better player than a robot. Just win. I don't want to get a million dollars. The devil that's it. And I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the second part of What If Deku Finds Ben's Watch Ultimatrix. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of the incredible muffin on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. Midoriya was in the unusual position of actually looking forward to high school. This was not just because he actually had friends that he was excited to see again, but also because one of his classes was being taught by his favorite hero. Well, all of his classes were being taught by heroes, and Midoriya was a fan of all of them, but this one was a special case. He wasn't the only one excited about today. He met up with Uraraka and Ida near UA and the three were chatting enthusiastically. It was amazing, Midoriya reflected, to interact with people who didn't put him down all the time. He tried to ignore that traitorous part of his mind that suggested that they were only his friends because they thought his quirk was cool, or that he had a quirk at all. Midoriya pushed that thought back for a while, and even managed to enjoy his classes. Then lunch rolled around, and he enjoyed that as well not just because the famous cooking hero, Lunch Rush, was serving the food, but because he got to eat alongside friendly classmates. It wasn't just Uraraka and Ida who sat next to him at the table, the pink girl, Hashido, and Siro also joined them. Midoriya found them to be an interesting contrast to his first two friends Ashido was spontaneous and casual where Ida was deliberate and formal, and Siro seemed permanently relaxed, where Uraraka was easily flustered. Still, they all got along rather well, and by the time lunch was over, the two were added to Midoriya's growing list of contacts. But all of that faded into the background as Class 1 went to their final lesson of the day heroics. Officially, nearly any pro hero who was employed by UA could teach the class, since one of them might be called in for a crisis elsewhere, and the schedules had to be flexible. Midoriya would have been excited to have any pro hero teach him how to achieve his dream, but the fact that the greatest hero in Japan and arguably the world was supposed to teach today was just that much more incredible. When is he going to show up? Uraraka whispered to him as they took their adjacent seats. Midoriya glanced at the clock. It should be any minute now. As the seconds dragged on, a worrying train of thought burrowed its way into his head. What if he doesn't remember me from the roof? What if he does remember me? and thinks I lied about having not having a quirk. I mean, I guess I did lie, retroactively, but it's not like I knew that at the time, and I am here. The doors to the classroom slammed open, coming through the door like a normal person. Ben, who was now floating next to Midoriya, rolled his eyes. Normal people don't slam doors open and shout at the top of their lungs. All Might, wearing his older Silver Age costume, for some reason complete with flowing cape, despite there not being any wind marched dramatically to the front of the class and turned to face the students, fists on his hips. Remember, students a flashy entrance is a great way to display confidence and reassure people that everything is going to be okay. He continued to grin, even as he pulled what looked like flashcards out from nowhere. Now, then basic hero training. This is the class that gives you a taste of what being a hero in the field is like. And the first of these lessons is this. He flipped one flashcard around, which had the word battle on it. Battle training. More than a few students got particularly excited for that. For his part, Midoriya was a little conflicted. It wasn't that he didn't expect to fight at some point in his hero career but he was more enthusiastic about saving people than hurting them, even if they were the bad guys. But before we can get started on your lesson, you'll need these. All Might pressed a button on a remote, and then the walls slid open, revealing 20 silver suitcases, all numbered 1 through 20. In accordance with the quirk registry and equipment request forms that you filled out before school started, here are your hero costumes. Even the students less enthusiastic about fighting began to get excited, after all. They'd all had at least some input in how their costumes were made, so these outfits were theirs. All right. All Might clapped his hands together. Despite the casual gesture, there was still a small shockwave that sent everyone rocking back in their seats. Grab your costumes and head to ground beta when you're all suited up. There was a mad dash as everyone headed to the suitcases. Though each had a large number, there was also a small tag with names attached. Much to Bakugo's anger, Midoriya's case had the number one on it. 
Okay, buddy, hurry up. Ben urged as Midoriya walked to the locker room to change. I want to see what you came up with. Though Ben had been present when Midoriya had come up with his costume design, he'd asked the hologram to shut down until he was done. He'd wanted it to be a surprise for his first real friend. Unfortunately, since all of his aliens came with their own outfits if they came with any at all that meant that whatever Midoriya actually wore would disappear. With that in mind, he wanted to come up with something comfortable, but also distinctly him. The best part was that he didn't take that long to change. Okay, I'm ready, Midoriya said, mostly to himself, but also to Ben. When Ben flickered into sight again, he blinked and then grinned. Looking good, kid. Where Ben Tennyson had worn jeans and a green jacket, Midoriya had taken his own spin on it. He wore dark blue combat pants, with pockets that held useful items like first aid tools just in case he needed to do help someone without transforming. He also wore a black t-shirt, under a dark green hoodie the hood of which paid homage to his idol by incorporating large ears that mimicked All Might's signature spiked tufts of hair. On the back of the hoodie was the Ultimatrix dial, carefully stitched in according to Midoriya's exacting specifications. For Midoriya, his costume represented the two biggest heroes in his life the one who inspired his dream and the one who helped him achieve it. The only thing that had nothing to do with All Might or Ben was the pair of red boots he wore, a sturdier version of his favorite shoes. An interesting costume, Midoriya-san, a familiar voice said. It is more practical than most, but it makes sense, considering your transformations. Midoriya turned and blinked. Ada's costume looked like a cross between a robot and a medieval knight. The white plates were sleek, but sturdy as was the black mesh between the plates. The boosters popping out of his legs and his general attitude gave even more credence to the robot warrior look. Thanks, Ida-san, he said. Your costume looks great, too. It looks a lot like Ingenian's costume. Though his helmet hit his face, Ida made a show of looking embarrassed. Oh, you know the Turbo Hero? Well, the thing is he is actually my older brother. Midoriya's jaw dropped. While Ingenium wasn't in the top 10 of Japan's heroes, he was still wildly popular and very successful. The fact that Midoriya was now friends with his younger brother was just so cool. Hey, guys, wait up. Siro jogged over to the other two boys, the rest of the male students right behind him. You know, Ida-san, I thought you'd take longer to get suited up, but then I remembered that speed is kinda your thing, huh? Ciro's outfit was sleek and efficient, it was mostly black and white, with orange shoulders, and more orange on his boots and the sleeves that ended above his elbows. Throughout the design, there was the motif of a roll of tape, up to and including his helmet that actually looked like a tape dispenser. That was unsurprising, considering that his quirk was called tape and involved shooting long strands of said substance from his canister-shaped elbows. He'd explained it all during lunch, and it was one more thing Midoriya wanted to write down in a notebook. Next was Bakugo, who stormed past Midoriya with only a furious glare, which, by his standards, meant that he was in a good mood. His outfit was made of blacks and greens, with a hint of orange. It was mostly simple and sturdy, with two notable exceptions. The first was the mask on his face, which wrapped around his head and ended in what looked like tiny explosions. The second were the two massive gauntlets on his forearms that looked like oversized hand grenades. Behind him was Kirishima. His outfit consisted mostly of black pants and boots, with a ragged waistcoat and red gear-shaped shoulder guards. But otherwise, his torso was completely bare. He also had a red R on his belt, and a black mask that had a faintly demonic look around his mouth and chin. He grinned and flexed one bicep, not that he needed to. Midoriya didn't know what training regimen turned Kirishima so ripped, but he was a little jealous. Then there was Sato Rikido, a large, big-lipped boy that looked like a stereotypical meathead at first glance, but he'd seemed nice enough yesterday. His spiky brown hair was mostly concealed by the yellow bodysuit he wore, yellow was the predominant color for his costume other than the white boots and gloves. He also had a white belt that was lined with small containers, though Midoriya didn't know what they held maybe that white powder he'd seen the boy eat yesterday that seemed to increase his strength. Next was Minta Minoru, the great boy who had come in last place during the test. His costume was mostly purple, to match his hair, but with yellow gloves, boots, cape, and a white diaper. Midoriya had no other way to describe it. It looked like a diaper, and for the life of him, he couldn't figure out what use it had. Like Midoriya himself, Kaminari had a more casual outfit. It consisted of black pants, a white shirt, and a black jacket over it that was decorated with white lightning bolts. He also wore some kind of headpiece with an antenna over his right ear. He saw Midoriya's own costume and grinned in approval. Kota Koji was, at first glance, rather intimidating. He was tall and broad, with a craggy rock of a head. Midoriya had yet to hear him speak, but his yellow and red outfit had stylized teeth on the front. 
so he figured that the larger boy's quirk had something to do with either his mouth or voice. Like Koda, Shoji was also intimidating. His outfit consisted of a blue and purple jumpsuit, with all six of his arms completely exposed. The costume might have been rather plain, but his physique more than made up for it, if anything. It drew attention to his arms. Takoyami Fumikage was also rather strange in appearance, from the neck down. He looked completely ordinary, but his head was that of a black feathered bird's. Midoriya wasn't sure what he was wearing under that black cloak that went down to his ankles, and he didn't know what the boy's quirk was, but Takoyami still gave off a stoic aura that kept everyone at a distance. Ayama Yuga practically skipped out of the locker room, which was all the weirder because he was wearing actual plate armor. The blonde-haired boy, who had a face set in a permanent if bizarre smile, practically glittered. His armor had several lenses, the most prominent of which was mounted over his stomach. During the tests yesterday, he'd explained that he used the lens on his belt to magnify the laser he could fire from his belly button. The blast was powerful enough to propel him through the air, but only for a few seconds at most, and then he fell to the ground. He had also explained that keeping up his laser for too long could make his stomach explode. Ayama noticed Midoriya studying him, and winked through his wing-shaped red glasses, and then fluttered his red cape. Midoriya wasn't quite sure how to react, so he just gave a thumbs up. Ajiro Mashura was doing some light stretches as he walked not just with his arms and legs, but with the thick tail that ended with a tuft of blonde hair that matched the hair on his head, and the fur that poked out of the left side of the collar of his white gi. Finally, there was Todoroki Shoto, the boy with the burn and two-toned hair. His costume was so plain it made Midoriya's look exotic. It was just a pair of white pants, shirt, and boots, with gold belts around his shoulders. He had created ice from his right side yesterday to launch himself forward during the standing long jump, and said that he could also create fire from his left, but he had only used ice. Good, we're all together, Ida said, and promptly turned and began walking down the hall. I believe the girls will be meeting us there. Oh man, I can't wait. Everyone took a few steps away from Minta, who was drooling again. Have you seen the hotties in this class? Their costumes are going to be so, ouch. Back Hugo reached out and picked up the small boy by the back of the neck. Quit running your disgusting little mouth, Grape we're here to be heroes, not ogle, so shut the hell up. It was one of the rare instances that Midoriya found himself in complete agreement with Back Hugo. Yes, it was obvious that the girls in the class were attractive, but Maitu was making everyone else uncomfortable. Speaking of the female students, the boys did indeed meet up with them on the way. Minta started to drool more, though with Bakugo stomping on his foot, he didn't do more. Hey, boys. Ashido dashed over with an even wider grin than usual. Looking good. So was she, if Midoriya was being completely honest. Ashido wore a low-cut bodysuit that was colored with purple and teal camouflage. She also wore beige boots, a sleeveless beige coat with a fur-lined collar, and a beige mask over the top half of her face, only exposing her black and yellow eyes. Her arms and shoulders were bare, because of her quirk. During lunch, she had explained that she could secrete acid from her body, though she preferred creating it from her arms and feet. Midoriya had seen her use that acid as a slide during the test yesterday, and she'd proven extremely athletic. Behind her, Jairo Kayoka was giving the boys a once-over. She looked unimpressed, though her gaze did linger on Kaminari a bit longer. That was probably because, between the two of them, they could have been in a band. Jairo wore a black leather jacket, black pants, a salmon-colored shirt that looked deliberately ripped in a few places, white fingerless gloves, and a black choker. The most prominent part of her costume were her boots, which looked like they had speakers built into them. She had also painted red triangles below her eyes. Midoriya jumped when someone poked his arm. Ribbit, I like your costume, Midoriya. Suitsuyu had done fairly well during the tests yesterday, particularly the ones involving her legs. She'd explained that her quirk, frog, basically let her do anything a frog could do, and her costume reflected that. It was a green bodysuit with black and yellow stripes, and the shoes had been designed to look like a frog's feet. She also had large white gloves and large goggles on her forehead that reminded Midoriya of a frog's eyes. She might have had a blank expression and hunched posture, but with her costume, it was kind of cute. Ah, uh, th thanks, Asui-san, he said. Yours is cool, too. Call me Tsuyu, Ribbit. Er, before Midoriya could respond, his attention was caught by what looked like disembodied gloves and boots moving past him. Then he remembered that one girl, Hagakir Toru, was completely invisible, except for her clothes. He wondered why she kept her gloves and boots visible, though, it would have made more sense to make them out of the same material as the rest of her costume unless she wasn't actually wearing anything else. Midoriya very deliberately pushed that thought aside. 
and it was immediately replaced by even worse thoughts when Yeyarazu walked past. The tall girl was obviously gorgeous, but her costume left almost nothing to the imagination. It was mostly just a red leotard, but the front of the middle third was gone, all the way to just past her navel. The costume was held together by a yellow belt on her upper chest, but only just. She also wore red boots and a pair of yellow belts around her waist that acted like a short skirt. On the back of the belt skirt was a shelf that held a large book. Logically speaking, Midoriya knew that it had to do with her quirk. Whenever she'd used it to create objects yesterday, she had exposed a part of her skin. That meant that she had to wear an outfit like that in order to effectively use her quirk. That didn't change the fact that Midoriya was a hormonal teenager, and Yeyarazu was easily the most beautiful girl he'd ever met. Ben had been silent, but now he had to comment. Okay, I'm pretty sure that costume is defying the laws of physics. With so many people around, Midoriya couldn't tell him to shut up, because he wasn't helping. Maybe Uraraka could help him take his mind off what he'd just seen. Oh, God help me. Uraraka was pretty, that much Midoriya could admit, but she'd never really shown off what she looked like. Her costume changed that. It was a black and pink bodysuit that did absolutely nothing to hide her curves, with large pink boots and pink wrist guards that had some kind of handle on the outside. Her head was protected by a pink helmet that had a darkened visor curving downward, and she had some kind of thin armor around the base of her throat and neck. Only her hands were completely exposed. Ben looked at her, then the rest of the girls of the class, and then shook his head sadly. Midoriya, you are so screwed. At that point, Midoriya nearly snapped at him, consequences be damned. But Uraraka chose that moment to bounce on over to him. And she literally bounced, Midoriya wondered if there were springs in her boots or something. But then he got distracted because of other parts of her that were bouncing. Hey, Deku-kun. Uraraka grinned at him with her boots, she was now almost as tall as he was. I love your costume, especially those bunny ears. They're not Midoriya cut himself off and sighed. Thanks, uraraka Sam. And, uh, your costume is, uh, it's kind of embarrassing. She admitted, her blush obvious even through her visor. I just asked them to make a costume that stimulated my pressure points and helped with nausea. But they made it a lot tighter than I expected. Why, yeah, Midoriya wasn't sure what else to say. But thankfully, All Might was there to bail him out. Looking good, students. All Might's smile grew wider as they walked into a waiting room. The clothes make the hero, and I certainly think you'll make quite the impression when you all debut. Now, follow me down to the observation room, and we can get to the lesson. Once All Might led the class to a much darker room, he looked down at another note card and nodded to himself. Before we begin, a little wisdom for when you're in the field while the more sensationalized hero events happen in the open. The truly dangerous villains will actually be indoors. This is because a home base gives them ample time to carry out their nefarious deeds, and they know the layout, while the heroes generally don't. In this scenario, the villains are hiding a bomb in a building. The heroes have located the base and must disarm said bomb before time runs out. You'll all be divided into teams of two, half of you will be heroes, the other half will be villains. The hero's objective is to simply touch the bomb. That will count as having disabled it. The villains only need to stop them, either by incapacitating the heroes or preventing them from touching the bomb in time. Much to Midoriya's embarrassment, most of the class immediately turned and began edging towards him. Obviously, they wanted to be partnered with someone so versatile. Once again, All Might came to the rescue. No, none of that. All Might wagged a finger in disapproval. Your teams will actually be decided by drawing lots. Eater raised his hand as All Might pulled out a box. All Might Sensei, is such a randomization really the best way to do this? Actually, that makes sense, Midoriya said, before he could stop himself. In a crisis, lots of heroes team up with whoever is available, and they usually don't have very long to plan. Exactly, young Midoriya. All Might gave him a thumbs up. Drawing lots is a good way to simulate the fluid nature of a dangerous scenario. Ah, oh, I understand. Ida bowed. Thank you both for the explanation. Not at all. That's why. All Might chuckled to himself. I am here. Some of the class laughed at his play on his famous phrase, while others groaned. Still, they all got in line to draw lots. Midoriya prayed that he be paired with anyone but Bakugo, and this time, the fates were kind. He drew the letter I, as did Uraraka, who jumped over to stand next to him. He tried to ignore how some of the class looked jealous. Now, normally, I'd have the matches be randomized as well. But you all took a bit too long getting changed, so we have less time than I'd like let that be a lesson for the future. Anyway, the heroes will be teams A, C, E, G, and I, while the villains will be teams B, D, F, H, and J. We'll be starting in order, so teams A and B, get on out to your assigned building. 
All Might paused and looked at another card. Well, you'll find the entrance to the field just down the stairs, and your building will have the villain's letter on the side. And remember, no causing serious injury to your opponents. But keep in mind that this is supposed to imitate a real crisis. So I encourage the villain teams to act the part. Speaking of which, I should mention that the villain team will have 10 minutes to get used to their base and to place their bomb. And then both sides will get 5 minutes to create a plan. After that, you have 15 minutes before the bomb goes off. Good luck to you all. Tima consisted of Yairazu and Siro, while Team B had Todoroki and Shoji. The hero team shared a brief smile before Siro put on his helmet, while the villain team barely nodded at each other. As soon as the teams left, All Might pressed a button on the computer behind him, revealing camera footage from both inside and outside the fake hideout. You'll all want to pay close attention, All Might said. You'll be learning by observing as well. Midoriya already had his notebook out and was scribbling furiously. It was a good way to not think about how he and Yuraraka would be going up against Bakugo and Ida in the final round. So, Kirishima said, in an effort to break the sudden silence, any bets on who's going to win this match? Well, Yeyarazu-san has an incredibly versatile quirk, Midoriya said, almost to himself. She can make practically anything, which means she can adapt to almost any situation. Siro-san's quirk is perfect for scaling walls, so I wouldn't be surprised if they tried to surprise the other team from above. On the other hand, Todoroki-san can generate ice, so if he makes enough of it fast enough, he could literally freeze the hero team in their tracks. Midoriya raised an eyebrow as he thought. Shoji-san said yesterday that he could turn his arms into other sensory organs, so he makes for the perfect lookout. If anything, this villain team might be the best choice for defense. It took him a moment to realize that everyone, even All Might, was staring at him. Um, what? Uraraka held up a hand, almost like she was addressing a teacher. Deku-kun, did you just come up with all of that off the top of your head? Midoriya immediately shrunk in on himself. I, it's a hobby. Sorry. Don't apologize, young Midoriya. All Might walked over and clapped him on the shoulder. On the fly analysis of someone's abilities is good for gauging how to fight against a villain or alongside a hero. He turned back to the screen. With that analysis in mind, what odds would you put on the heroes winning? Midoriya shrugged. Not good, All Might Sensei. If the hero team can avoid being seen by Shoji-san, and if they try to sneak in from above, they'll have one shot to get to the bomb. If they miss, Todoroki-san will probably freeze them immediately. Minta grinned. Thu, a cold Yeyorazu means a wet Yeyoro. Nobody commented when Asui extended her long, powerful tongue and slapped Minta across the face. Instead, they watched the screen. So, uh, you sure you don't want me to carry you up the side? Yeyorazu smiled and shook her head. No, thank you. We need to make sure that the roof is empty, and you'll be more agile if I'm not in the way. If it's safe, just lower some tape and pull me up. After that, we'll sneak in from above and hopefully surprise the other team before they can react. We'll have to be really quiet, Siro said. I think Shoji-san can make extra ears. That's true, thankfully, I have an idea. Yeyorazu's stomach glowed, and four footprint-shaped pads with shoelaces emerged. This is a soundproofing material. It should mask our approach. Awesome. Siro quickly tied the padding to the bottoms of his boots. All we need are some shuriken, and we'll be ninjas. Yeyorazu smiled at his enthusiasm, even as she modified her own footwear. Remember, we'll have to be fast once we locate the bomb. If you can slow the other team down, even for a few seconds, I'll keep them in place, and you can go for the weapon. You got it. Siro stretched out his arms. Time to go to work. Hero team. All Might's voice boomed out of the nearby speakers. Begin. Siro nodded once more at his teammate, and then aimed his left elbow at the villain's five-story hideout. A line of tape shot out at incredible speeds and attached just past the fourth floor. He pulled himself up as quickly as he could, and then shot another line of tape to pull himself up the rest of the way. He poked his head over the roof to briefly scan it, and then tapped the communicator in his helmet which had been provided from a table just outside the field. Yeyorazu-san, it's clear. Rather than answer, Yeyorazu nodded, and then held out her hand expectantly. Siro lowered a long line of tape, and once she had a good grip, he pulled her up. Stage 1, complete, Siro said in an overly serious tone that made Yeyorazu smile. Good thing there's a rooftop door, though, otherwise, we'd have to risk the fifth floor windows. Yeyorazu winced. That's a good point. I hadn't considered that this training area might not be 100% accurate. Stupid, Momo. Get your head in the game. Determined to make up for her perceived blunder, she opened the door and quietly led the way down the stairs to the fifth floor. 
The lights were out, likely because of Todoroki and Shoji, the hero's vision was limited, while the villains weren't as hampered, thanks to Shoji's enhanced senses. Because of the darkness, it took several minutes to check that neither the bomb nor the villain team was there. By Yeyurazu's estimate, they had less than 10 minutes left. We need to hurry, she whispered as quietly as she could into her earpiece. We don't have much time. Then we need to find that bomb. And fast, Siro's own whisper was loud in her ear. They're not on the fifth floor, and they wouldn't be dumb enough to put in on the first. The third floor sounds like a safe bet. You're right. At the center, it's easier to defend and counterattack. Still, we should be careful until wait, is it getting colder in here? Before Siro could respond, a thin layer of ice began rapidly creeping across the floor. Within seconds, it had almost reached them. Move, Siro shouted, and then used his tape to swing up to the ceiling. Thinking quickly, Yeyurazu made a wide, sweeping motion with her right arm, producing a wave of rock salt at the same time. The salt blocked some of the ice heading for her, but more crept around to encircle her. Siro-san, go for the bomb, she yelled. I'll try to hold Todoroki-san off. Siro hesitated only for a moment, but nodded. Okay, good luck. Don't think I'll let you go so easily, Todoroki said as he stepped out of the shadows. His entire left side was covered in armor-like ice, which made an ominous crunch with every step. He raised his right arm, and a pillar of ice shot up at Siro, who barely swung out of the way in time. Rather than try to hit Siro with more pillars, Todoroki just tapped his right foot on the floor. A moment later, the stairways were frozen over. The wind before Yeyurazu could finish her sentence, all of the windows were covered in ice as well. Just how powerful is he? What's his limit? Does he even have one? We'll just have to fight him, Siro said, and fired a line of tape from his spot on the ceiling that looped around Todoroki's torso. That lasted about two seconds before Todoroki froze the tape halfway to the source, Siro's elbow, and then easily shattered it. Yeyurazu aimed her palm at Todoroki and produced a long pole, tipped with a small fist. It shot straight at Todoroki's head, but with a single step from his right foot, a wall of ice shot up to block it. That was only a diversion, she thought, and drew her other arm back. Now, I'll just make a flashbang grenade to throw him off, and... Yeyurazu had just started creating the grenade when her arm became even colder than the rest of her. She looked down and saw that a small pillar of ice had sprouted under the limb and had frozen around it. It began moving up her arm, until she was frozen up to the shoulder. Ice then grew around her ankles and slowly crept up her legs, holding her in place. Yay Yorak. Siro tried to swing down to free his teammate, only for Todoroki to create another ice wall in his path. This time, his timing was more precise, and Siro slammed headlong into the ice. A moment later, he was also trapped. That's enough. All Might's voice boomed from the speakers. The hero team is trapped, the villains win. Todoroki wasted no time freeing his classmates from his ice. All it took was a few minutes of fire from his left side. Shoji also emerged from downstairs and used his considerable strength to help move the larger chunks of ice. Even as she created towels to help dry herself and Siro, Yeyurazu couldn't help but feel dejected. We were completely outclassed, their strategy countered everything we could have done. Whoa. Kaminari broke the silence in the observation room first. I hate to make a pun, but Todoroki was cold out there. I heard that, Todoroki said as the two teams walked inside. Eep. Kaminari jumped and quickly hid behind Kirishima. First of all, I want to congratulate both teams, All Might said. You both had good plans, and the heroes kept their cool sorry, young Todoroki even when their own plans started to fall apart. Keeping a clear head is an important quality to have in the field. Now, then, before the next teams go out, I'd like to hear some feedback from the rest of the class. Ashido held up her hand. I don't know if this is really feedback, but Midori was right, before. This whole thing gives a huge advantage to whoever is playing defense. Yeyurazu turned to Midoriya with a slightly hurt look on her face. You knew we would lose. Midoriya immediately blushed and shook his head. And no, IJ just said that the villain team had really good defensive options, and they had more time to prepare. Why you had a good strategy, Yeyurazu-san, it was just that. He trailed off and looked at the rest of the class with an expression that begged for help. You would have done well against almost any other team, Todoroki said not patronizingly but just stating a simple fact. You were quiet enough that Shoji-san couldn't hear you, and neither did I. I just waited by the stairs until I saw you. The rest of the class shared similar sentiments. It wasn't that the heroes had a bad plan. It just didn't survive contact with the enemy. Excellent points, everyone. All Might nodded. Now, before we move on, I'd like to say that young Todoroki was the MVP of this match. He had a plan and the skill to handle two unpredictable opponents. Todoroki only shrugged as the rest of the class minus Bakugo politely applauded. 
All right, time for the next teams, C and D, to get ready. Hagakure and Ishido were the villains, so they left first. A few minutes later, Sato and Asui left to make their own plan. While that happened, Yeyorazu noticed Midoriya scribbling in his notebook. Midoriya-san, were you taking notes during the first match? Midoriya jumped and stared up at her with his big eyes. Honestly, she found it a little cute that someone so powerful was so nervous around people, especially girls. W well, yes, he admitted. Sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. It's just that learning about quirks and their applications is a hobby of mind. And Yeyorazu giggled. It's fine, I don't mind. Oh oh, good. Um, while we wait, could I ask you about your quirk? I saw that you can make things, but how does it work? It's nothing special, Yeyorazu said, waving him off. I just turn the lipids in my body into any inorganic object I want. I just have to know the molecular composition of the item in question. Wait, Midoriya's eyes went even wider. You mean, you know the molecular formula for soundproofing material off the top of your head? Um yes, Gyro, who Yeyorazu had become friends with the day before, grinned. See, Yamomo here had the best middle school grades in the country. Figuring out how to make soundproof footwear is a piece of cake. Yayorazu blushed at the praise and the attention she was getting, but didn't deny any of it. Although, excuse me, Yamomo. Jairo shrugged. No offense, but your full name is kind of a mouthful. Besides, Ashido calls Midori a Midori, so you're not the first to get a name shortening. Yuraka held up her hand. All in favor of calling Yayorazu San Yamomo, say I. I, most of the students present raised their hands. Embarrassed, but less depressed about her match, Yeyorazu glanced at Siro, who just grinned, he wasn't down about what happened, and he clearly wasn't upset with her. She decided to just do better next time. Of course, if she had to face off against classmates again, she'd have to be more prepared. With that in mind, she took a page out of Midoriya's book and created a notebook and a pencil of her own, she had notes to take. All of the matches went by rather quickly. Ashido and Hagakure lost when Asui managed to catch the latter with her incredibly long tongue. Sato had eaten his sugar to boost his strength, and then slammed the ground hard enough to create a shockwave that sent Ashido flying before she could create any acid. Still dragging Hagakure with her tongue, Asui then hopped over to the bomb and tying things up between heroes and villains. Since Asui had come up with the tactics to defeat the villains and had multitasked by the end, she received the MVP award. The next match pitted Ayama and Mainta as the heroes against Jairo and Takoyami. At first, it looked like the hero team would win handily. Mainta had started things off by pulling his sticky purple balls off his head and had trapped Jairo's foot to the floor. Takoyami had tried to free his teammate by using his own quirk, a living entity that emerged from within him called Dark Shadow. Ayama turned out to be a hard counter for the living quirk. His naval laser's light drove back the darkness that was Dark Shadow, forcing him to retreat back within Takoyami. That lasted until Gyro extended her living jacks down to her boots. Her heartbeats boomed out from her speakers, sending both heroes flying out of a first-floor window. Unfortunately, Minda had been holding two more balls at the time, and they ended up accidentally gluing him to Ayama's leg. The two struggled for the rest of the test, while Gyro and Dark Shadow laughed. In the end, Gyro had received the MVP for her ability to counterattack before the hero team had capitalized their advantage. The penultimate match was won by the heroes almost by accident. Hiroshima and Ajiro had taken out Kota within seconds, but Kaminari discovered that he was far more dangerous than the two close combat specialists expected. His quirk created massive amounts of electricity, and though Ajiro had landed a good hit on the boy with his tail, he'd been paralyzed by Kaminari in return. Hiroshima had lasted longer. His quirk, hardening, could give his body a rock-like appearance that was both armor and a weapon. However, though he punched Kaminari hard enough to knock the wind out of him, the electricity had messed with his muscle control, forcing him out of his hardening. Kaminari had recovered first and limped to the bomb, though Kirishima had held on to the other boy's leg the entire time, shouting about how he should stay and fight like a real man. Still, the hero team won, but Kirishima was named MVP for his sheer tenacity. Throughout all the matches, Midoriya provided a running commentary. He pointed out how certain quirks had specific weaknesses that other quirks could take advantage of, but it still fell to the users in question to recognize those advantages. He also made a point of complimenting both sides after every match, praising what they did right, and pointing out how they could do better next time. Even some of the students who were less gracious in defeat were aware that Midoriya was actually giving good advice. By the time of the final match, though, everyone noticed how nervous Midoriya was. His trembling only got worse whenever he so much as glanced at Bakugo, and no one missed the hatred on Bakugo's face. It was as if Midoriya's mere existence offended him, 
but none of them could figure out why, from their perspective, Midoriya had only been friendly and helpful, if a little awkward. All Might, however, knew the truth, or at least suspected it. While he was widely respected for his power, his courage, and his selflessness, people didn't really attribute high intelligence with him. That wasn't to say that people thought he was dumb. He just gave the impression that he would rather act first and think second. When he put his mind to something, however, he was quite sharp. After Bakugo's actions the day before, All Might had looked up Midoriya's school records. A few counselors had made notes that Midoriya showed signs that he was being bullied, but no action had ever been taken to help him or punish the guilty. It was obvious who the guilty party was, though, and one counselor in Midoriya's middle school had sent a letter to the principal, suggesting that Bakugo be taken in for disciplinary action. That same counselor had been threatened with unpaid leave the next day. All Might understood why, and he hated it. Bakugo was talented, smart, possessed an amazing quirk, and had all the makings of a pro hero. If he made it big, his previous schools would gain enormous prestige. That was enticing enough to let his bullying slide then. But not now, All Might wouldn't tolerate such behavior, and neither would anyone else in UA. Bakugo would become a better human being, or he would be expelled, simple as that. All right, he said out loud, getting the class attention. Villain team, head on out, prepare your bomb, and make your plan. Hero team, you know the drill by now, so just wait before entering your designated zone. Good luck to both teams. Bakugo gave Midoriya one more hate-filled glare, and then stalked off, Ida hot on his heels. As soon as he was gone, Midoriya sighed and nearly fell to his knees. Yuraraka put a hand on his shoulder. Deku-kun, are you okay? Midoriya took a deep breath. All might notice that the boy seemed to take strength from positive reactions. Something to note for later classes. I'll be fine, yuraraka san Thanks. Midoriya took another deep breath. Kakainer, Bakugo and I, we have some bad history. Let's just leave it at that, okay? Even a few months ago, Midoriya would have never said even that much. However, he had spent a long time talking to Ben about it, and the hologram had convinced that Bakugo really wasn't his friend anymore. Midoriya still respected the other boy, though, and thought that he would become an amazing hero. He decided that he wouldn't sabotage Bakugo's future by telling anyone details, but he was done defending him. Midoriya's words were quiet and likely meant for Yuraraka only, but the rest of the class heard him. None of the students were stupid. They, like All Might, suspected that Bakugo had been antagonistic towards Midoriya before, and since he'd thought he'd been quirkless for most of his life, he'd had no real way to defend himself. All Might hoped that Bakugo improved his attitude soon, or he'd have an entire class hating him. Come on, let's go downstairs, Yuraraka urged. We can come up with a plan. Midoriya paused, and All Might swore he glanced at the empty air for a moment. When he turned back to Yuraraka, there was a more determined look in his eyes. I think I already have an idea. Uh, one second. He held up his notebook. Can someone hold on to this until I get back? Yeyurazu, who had cheered up since her match, especially when Midoriya got her talking about quirks and All Might wasn't sure if it had been deliberate, but he was positive that the tall girl had found the boy quite charming held out her hand. Of course, Midoriya-san. Good luck to you both. All Might kept up his smile as the hero team left. I won't play favorites. Young Midoriya, however, I wish you luck in facing your demons. I know from experience how painful that can be. Okay, Deku-kun, what's your idea? Midoriya wished that Yuraraka would stop hopping up and down. It was distracting him. Ida-san seems strong, and so does Bakugo-san. But we have you, right? I can't do everything, Midoriya said, and Yuraraka finally stopped jumping. I don't want you to rely on me to do everything, and we can still lose, no matter what I turn into. Kak Bakugo is strong, fast, and smart, and I doubt I'll be able to surprise him more than once. Ida is also fast, and I wouldn't want to get kicked by him. But you did say you have an idea, Yuraraka said. Why yeah? Midoriya put a hand to his chin and started to pace. I noticed that Ida ran faster when he had more time to run, so if you can keep him from any long hallways, he probably won't be able to run too fast for you to grab him. As for Bakugo I know how his quirk works. More importantly, I know its biggest weakness. I seriously doubt that Bakugo will work with Ida on anything. As he continued to pace, Yuraraka watched with fascinated eyes. He'll come after us instead of waiting. But he's not stupid, he'll probably have Ida guarding the bomb. If we're lucky, we'll avoid Bakugo and reach Ida before it's too late. We can overwhelm him and get the bomb. 
Yuraka hated to interrupt, but the way Midoriya seemed afraid of Bakugo had her nervous. What if we're not lucky? Midoriya paused, and then took a deep, steadying breath she'd seen him do that a lot, and it almost seemed like he was following instructions. Like I said, I know his quirk, and how he thinks. I can counter him, and while we fight, you go on ahead to the bomb. If you fight it up, don't let him build up speed, get in his face so that he can't use his legs. Even if you can't use your quirk on him, just rattle his cage until you see an opening for the bomb that's the objective. Yuraka pumped a fist. You got it, Deku-kun. So, what are you going to turn into? Midoriya frowned thoughtfully, then activated the Ultimatrix. He cycled through his aliens, until he found the one he wanted. He held his hand over the dial and waited expectantly. Hero Team All Might said, start. Midoriya slammed down the dial and vanished in a flash of green. Four arms. Now it was Yuraraka's turn to frown. Hasn't he seen that one? I thought you wanted to surprise him. Four arms gave her a thumbs up with three hands. Don't worry, it's part of my plan. The Hero Team made their way into the hideout. Four arms was in front, ready to move in front of Yuraraka, in case Bakugo ambushed them and tried to blow them away. They didn't find the villain team, or the bomb, on the first floor, but that just made four arms more nervous. It's going to be okay, Ben said as he floated alongside him. You're strong, Izuku, strong enough to face him. You just need to stand your ground and fight. He's right, four arms thought. This is something I have to do. Bakugo has pushed me around for years, and he needs to stop. This is the only way he'll accept that I'm not a worthless Deku anymore. As they moved through the second floor, they heard footsteps heading their way. Four arms took one more fortifying breath and then rounded the corner. There was Bakugo, waiting patiently in front of the stairs to the next floor. The plan to avoid him had officially gone out the window. Well, well, Bakugo said with a sneer, if it isn't little Deku, still trying to play hero, huh? Even though his old tormentor still scared him, four arms couldn't help but raise an eyebrow. In his current form, he was almost twice as tall as Bakugo, so he didn't know where he got off calling him little. You're not going anywhere near the bomb, Deku. Bakugo snarled and crouched low, his arms curled and ready to unleash explosions. And when I'm done with you, you're going to realize that you should never have tried coming to UA. Yuraraka San four arms drew all of his arms back. Go. Just as Bakugo started to extend his arms, four arms clapped all four of his hands together. It created a focused shockwave that sent Bakugo tumbling back. While Bakugo tried to regain his footing, Yuraraka ran up the stairs. Oh, you think you're cute, letting your girlfriend go on ahead. Bakugo aimed his palms at four arms. After I'm done beating you into a pulp, I'm gonna find her, and then there's gonna be two less students in our class. Okay, I'm not baiting him anymore, four arms thought angrily. Now, I just want to hurt him. You aren't going to touch her, he said, his voice a low growl. Not after I'm done with you. In the observation room, the class watched closely. Everyone noticed when Four Arms' expression changed. I kinda wish we could hear what they were saying, Ashido said. I mean, it's obvious that Bakugo said something to piss off Midori. Then again, he doesn't seem like the angry type, so maybe I don't want to know. Yeyorazu frowned. I don't think it really matters. It's obvious that those two have some bad blood between them, and if Midoriya-san thought he was quirkless until recently, it's only now that he has a chance to fight back. Bakugo sneered again. His palm glowed, visible even through his glove, and he unleashed a large explosion that sent four arms sprawling. His outfit was now a little singed, and his ears were ringing, but he was more or less unharmed. Bakugo was certainly surprised when he got to his feet. I'm tired of being your punching bag, four arms said through clenched teeth. Now, it's my turn. He slapped the dial on his chest, and Bakugo shielded his eyes from the light. Water hazard. This new form was still taller than Bakugo, it looked like a humanoid shellfish, with a thick red and grey exoskeleton. He had a sloped hump rising over and around his head, and had a hole in each of his palms. What the hell is that? Bakugo mocked. An oversized lobster. No, Water Hazard said in a raspy voice. This is payback. Now it was Bakugo's turn to watch as his opponent aimed a palm at him. He was almost too late to react when a jet of water lanced towards him. He quickly aimed his hands at the floor and fired off an explosion that sent him up to the ceiling. He dodged the water, but then had to fire another explosion to avoid a second stream. His maneuvering brought him right over Water Hazard into what Bakugo liked to call face exploding range. Water Hazard brought up an arm to protect his face from the explosion that knocked him flat on his back. You know, you really haven't changed, Bakugo said as he landed. You have all that power, but you're still useless. I'm not. Water Hazard slowly got to his feet and then quickly lashed out with more water that caught Bakugo on the arm. I'm not useless. Bakugo scowled. That water had had a lot of pressure behind it, and if he hadn't rolled with the hit, it might have dislocated his arm at the elbow. 
He raised that same arm to return the favor but nothing happened. What the fuck? Beck Hugo looked down at his gloved hand. His soaking wet hand. Like I told you Araka-san, Water Hazard said, I know your quirk almost as well as you do. It's hard to ignite something when it's sopping wet, huh? You bastard. Beck Hugo launched himself up with his dry hand. You think you can beat me? I only need one hand to blow you away. With only one explosion to send him upward, his launch was off kilter, and Water Hazard capitalized on that. He aimed at Beck Hugo's other hand, but only managed to glance it. Still, it was enough to send him careening out of control and into a wall. Water Hazard wasn't sure, but he thought he heard a sickening pop as Beck Hugo's shoulder was dislocated. For that moment, he wasn't in a training session instead. He was a little boy again, who saw his friend get hurt. Kakin, he said, hurrying up to him, I'm sorry, are you? Shut up. Beck Hugo aimed his working arm the partially dry one at him and fired a much larger blast that sent Water Hazard into the wall with so much force that it left a Water Hazard-shaped crater. Are you seriously taking pity on me? Don't you dare pity me, you damn nerd. You're right, Water Hazard grunted as he pulled himself free. That was dumb. You're the villain here, and I'm the hero. I can feel guilty about hurting you later. However, as much as he wished otherwise, he didn't feel guilty. In fact, after years of being Buck Hugo's favorite victim, it felt great to dish it back. But that wasn't who Midoriya was, he was someone who wanted to help people, even his greatest enemy. He couldn't just hit people, because that wasn't who he was. I'll be sure you receive the best care, villain, water hazard said, falling into character. Not just for your hospital stay, but also so that you can maybe rejoin society one day. Back Hugo, for his part, just rolled his eyes. Oh, just die, Deku. He raised his semi-dry hand for an explosion, but water hazard was quicker on the draw, and a torrent of water soaked Beck Hugo's hand. Just for good measure, water hazard left the other boy completely drenched. Damn it. Back Hugo sputtered and tried to maintain his footing on the slippery floor. This isn't how it's supposed to be. I'm supposed to be a hero, and you you're nothing. Water hazard shook his head sadly. Back Hugo just wasn't facing reality. Just as Beck Hugo, now unable to use his quirk, but unwilling to give up, charged at him, Water Hazard slapped the Ultimatrix dial. Swamp fire. Now, he was a tall humanoid that seemed to be made of green plant material, except for his head, which looked more like stylized fire. Sorry, Beck Hugo, but this is where it ends. It ends when I say it ends, Deku. Beck Hugo slammed his uninjured arm into Swamp Fire's side but his blow just sank into the soft vegetable matter. More surprising was that, although the scrapes and scorches from water hazard had carried over to this new form, those blackened sections of swamp fire quickly regained his color. Whatever this form was, it possessed regeneration. That that's just not fair. No, it doesn't. Swamp fire's deep, nasally voice was almost sad as he drew back his fist and drove it into Beck Hugo's nose. The blow sent him stumbling back. Swamp fire finished the fight when he plucked several of the red seeds from his shoulders and tossed them at Beck Hugo's feet, where they exploded into thick vines that completely immobilized him. Swamp fire ignored Beck Hugo's increasingly inventive stream of curses as he looked up. I hope your Araka-san is doing okay. Uraraka would be the first to admit that she wasn't a violent person. As a hero, she knew that there was a good chance that she would have to fight at some point. But she'd always envisioned herself as more of a rescue hero, like 13, her favorite hero. Unfortunately, there was no rescuing to be done today just combat, and her opponent was more suited to that than she was. It seems that a foolish hero has stumbled into my lair. Ida held his arms out to his sides and laughed as maniacally as he could. You have come here to try and stop me only to fall. Uraraka tried very hard to keep a straight face. Ida was many things, but a good actor wasn't one of them. Sorry, but I don't have time for this, villain. Uraraka brought her hands in close, ready to lunge for Ida or make herself float at a moment's notice. I'm here to stop you and save this city. Ida took a step back, and Uraraka heard his boosters begin to warm up. You will try. There was less than 20 feet separating them, from what Uraraka had seen yesterday, and what Deku had told her. Ida hadn't been able to reach his maximum speeds when crossing 50 meters. Like her partner had said, all she had to do was make sure that he didn't build up enough speed. I'll succeed. Uraraka dashed forward, keeping her center of gravity low, and making herself as small a target as possible. Ida charged, then spun around on one leg to build up momentum with his other. 
His boosters were far from their maximum, but an armored kick to the head still hurt, even with her helmet. Iraraka saw stars as she was sent flying back, and she connected with the wall with a solid crunch. When her vision settled, there was a spiderweb of cracks across her visor and a nasty scrape on her shoulder. Still, it wasn't as bad as when she'd been trapped during the entrance exam. At least there was no giant robot about to kill her. She got up and again ran at Ida, who brought his leg around for another devastating kick. This time, though, Yuraraka was prepared. She leaned back and slid feet first under the kick while reaching out with one hand. Ida's reaction speeds were impressive. He leaned back on one heel and used his boosters to send him flying up at an angle, then twisted around and brought his fist into her face. This time, her visor shattered. She felt dots of pain on her face as shards dug into her face. Rather than let herself fall on her back, Yuraraka slapped her hand against her chest to make her weightless. As she started to float, she saw Ida coming down, almost on top of her. Now's my chance. Ignoring her nausea as much as possible, Yuraraka twisted around, curled her legs in as tightly as she could, and then kicked out. Years of practicing with her quirk had taught her the value of timing of knowing just when to apply or release her power. So, just when her boots connected with Ida's chest, she released her quirk. With weight suddenly behind the double kick, Ida was sent tumbling, while Yuraraka rolled backwards. Her head connected with the floor a few times, but her damaged helmet prevented any concussions. Before Ida could recover fully, Yuraraka dashed for the bomb on the far side of the room. No. Strong hands wrapped around her legs. I won't let you win. That's too bad, Yuraraka shouted, because I'm not giving up. Ida did his best to drag Yuraraka back, but instead they fell forward. Yuraraka saw stars once more as her chin connected with the floor, but her hand connected with something else. The bomb has been disabled. All Might shouted. The hero team wins. As soon as the buzzer went off, Ida scrambled off of Yuraraka and helped her to her feet. Excellently done, Yuraraka san You are truly oh my goodness, are you all right? Um, I think so, why? Yuraraka brought her hand to her face and it came away bloody. Oh, Yuraraka san Ida san The familiar voice had the two students turn. Oh, I bet Deku-kun is going to freak out, Yuraraka thought. Hey, Deku-kun, we won. Midoriya, now back to normal, dropped what had been an adorable smile in favor of abject horror. Oh my god, what happened? Ida bowed low. My apologies. I damaged Yuraraka-san's helmet, and she fell. She couldn't see it, but Yuraraka looked like she'd walked out of a horror film. Her cheeks bled from the shrapnel of her visor, and her chin had been busted open. When she'd wiped it, a layer of blood was smeared over her jaw. W we need to get you to recovery girl. Midoriya dashed over and put her arm over his shoulder. Ida Sam, already on it. Ida gently took her other arm, the injured one, and then had an idea. He waved at one of the cameras, pointed at Yuraraka, and then at the door. I understand, young Ida. Please, escort young Yuraraka to recovery girl. I'll free young Bakugo and give you three your scores later. At this point, the adrenaline had faded and Yuraraka was starting to feel the pain. She also started to get a little dizzy. Wait, why does Bakugo-san need to be freed? I'll explain later, Midoriya promised, then hesitantly patted her on the back. You are great, Yuraraka-san. She giggled. You don't even know what I did. Midoriya shrugged with the shoulder not supporting her. It d doesn't matter. I know you are great. Yuraraka wasn't sure what was sweeter his words, or how he tried to hide his blush under his hood. Thanks, Deku-kun. Well, now that that's all settled, All Might said as he and Bakugo who had outright refused to go to Recovery Girl until he found out his score walked into the observation room. Let's all discuss what happened. Yeyurazu held up her hand. I think that it's obvious that Midoriya-san is still getting used to his quirk. His decision to use water against Bakugo-san was a good one, but he should have started with that, instead of allowing himself to get blasted at the beginning. In addition, had he used that form in conjunction with Yuraraka-san, they likely would have won much faster, and then could have teamed up against Ida-san. Bakugo glared at her. Watch it, ponytail. No, she has a point, Shoji said. If Midoriya-san had kept you pinned with his water, Yuraraka-san could have easily tagged you with her quirk. Yeyurazu nodded in thanks as she wrote all of that down. All Might Sensei, I can give this feedback to the others when we finish, if that's all right with you. Of course, young Yeyurazu. All Might's smile grew wider. Your consideration for your classmates is commendable. But, back to the match. Anything else to add? Kaminari raised a hand. Um, couldn't Bekugo have blasted up the entrances? Even if he had done that on his way to face the hero team alone, that would have slowed Yuraraka-san a bit. Ribbit, and Ida-san could have just picked up the bomb and ran around with it, Asui said, then tapped her cheek with her gloved hand. 
Come to think of it, none of the villain teams did that, and there was no rule saying they couldn't. Thanks to the darkness, there was no way to see the nervous sweat on All Might's brow if there was. It would have been obvious that he had never considered that option either. Yes, well, those are all very good points. However, due to her quick thinking and tenacity, I declare that young Uraraka is MVP of this match. Your final scores will be ready outside in a moment. Please, take them and then head to the locker room to change. And then you can all head home. Anyone else who feels like their injuries may hamper them are also encouraged to see Recovery Girl especially you, young Bakugo. Bakugo scowled. TCH. Fine. The students filed out of the room, leaving All Might alone once he was absolutely sure that Hagakure hadn't stayed behind. He reverted to his skinny form. These kids, he muttered as he began typing grades into a computer. They almost gave me a heart attack a few times. Was I that reckless when I was that age? By the time Yeyarazu and Asui who had decided to help brought the notes to the infirmary, only Yuraraka was still in her costume. Midoriya and Ida had taken the opportunity to change into their regular uniforms while Recovery Girl removed the shrapnel from Yuraraka's face. You're lucky these are all small. Dearie the two girls heard as they opened the door. There won't be any scarring. Recovery Girl kissed Uraraka's forehead. A moment later, the cuts on her face were gone, as was the scrape on her shoulder. She swayed tiredly, and Midoriya helped her lay down on the cot she was sitting on. Yeyurazu shared a smile with Asui when they saw how adorable that was. She'll be fine, Recovery Girl assured the boy, who looked on the verge of panicking. Give her a few minutes to catch her breath, and then make sure she can walk to the locker room. If there are no problems, she can head straight home. Midoriya and Ida both sighed. That's a relief, Midoriya said, and then noticed the new arrivals. Hello, Yeyurazu san, Asui san. Ribbit, I said call me Tsuyu. Asui walked over to Yuraraka. So, she's going to be okay. Recovery girl smiled kindly. She'll be fine, like I said. A few scratches and scrapes are hardly going to slow her down for long. Do you young ladies need my services? Yeyurazu shook her head. No, thank you, we just came to check on Yuraraka san and to give all three of them their grades. She also held out a familiar notebook to Midoriya. You also left this with me, Midoriya-san. Midoriya went red-faced as he took back his notebook. TH thanks for that, Yeyurazu-san. Yeyurazu smiled. I think the class has agreed to just call me Yamomo. Midoriya nodded, and then looked at his grades and feedback. Okay, I still got an 80%, but these points all make sense. Now I know how to be better for next time. Yuraraka sleepily looked over her own notes. Maybe I should ask the support department for a stronger helmet or at least one with a chin guard. The conversation focused mainly on the matches, but it came to a screeching halt when the doors opened, and Bakugo stomped in, followed by several other students. Despite having a dislocated shoulder, he had managed to get back into his uniform. Oh dear, that looks unpleasant, recovery girl said, looking at his swollen arm. Sit down, dearie, and I'll get you fixed up. Bakugo only scowled, while his eyes remained fixed on Midoriya in a way that no one liked. It felt like he was about to attack the smaller boy at the smallest provocation. Midoriya swallowed nervously, but his view was suddenly blocked when Ida, Ashido, Siro and Yeyarazu circled around him to talk, their backs to Bakugo. When the taller boy opened his mouth, he was cut off when Kirishima put a hand on his shoulder. Hey, man, you gotta tell me what your secret is for powering through all that, Kirishima said. That was pretty manly. Bakugo shook his hand off. I just hate losing, now screw off, shitty hair. If he was expecting Kirishima to back away after the insult, he was disappointed. In fact, he just grinned wider. Bakugo was about to ask what his deal was, but then Recovery Girl was there, passing out her healing kisses. A few seconds later, Bakugo was asleep on his cot. Come on, everyone, Yeyarazu said to the group surrounding Midoriya, let's give Recovery Girl space to work. Welcome home, boys, Inko said as Izuku walked through the door, with Ben right behind him. How is school? It was interesting, Izuku said. I made a lot of new friends. Inko smiled widely and tried not to cry. After years of being mistreated by society, hearing that her son was making friends made her so happy. Ben grinned at her. Yeah, and he beat the stuffing out of Bakugo. Wait, what? Ben, Midoriya was still getting used to the idea of having friends, much less actually having them. So he was rather surprised at himself when he created a group chat on his messenger app and invited all of the friends who were in his contacts list. On a whim, he named it UAS Rising Stars and settled down to wait and see if any of his friends joined. Of course, as soon as he did, he immediately began to panic. Most of them only joined my contacts list a few hours ago. Is it too soon to talk to them? Too late. Oh, this was a huge mistake. Before he could spiral too far, 
His phone buzzed several times, to his honest shock. Everyone had joined in at the same time. While he whispered and opened up the app, he quickly selected his avatar, All Might's face and began to type. All Might, hi, everyone. There, that sounded good, right. A moment later, several avatars appeared a pair of glasses, a comet, a tape dispenser, a book, and a pink crayon. Glasses, greetings, Midoriya-san. I assume that is you, since I cannot think of anyone else who is such a big fan of All Might. Those ears on your costume are a bit of a giveaway. They're not ears, Midoriya grumbled, then returned his attention to his phone, ignoring Ben's laughter. All Might, yeah, it's me. Hi, Ida Sam. Tape, hi, guys. I didn't know we all use this app. Oh, and this is Ciro, but that's kinda obvious. Look, it is very you, Ciro Sam. I couldn't find any avatars that really represented me, except for this one. I should mention that this is Momo, it's easier to type out my first name. Comet, hi, yeah, Momo. Hi, guys. How's everyone recovering from two days' lessons? Crayon, hey, girl. Is all good here, but are you okay? You were bleeding pretty bad. Comet, I'm fine now, Ashido Sam. Hey, Deku-kun, can I invite Suyu-chan? I got her number before I went home. All might, sure. And I'm glad you're doing better. You scared me when I saw you. Glasses, I believe I speak for us all that we were worried about you, Uraraka san There was a great deal of blood. Crayon, okay, enough. Y'all need to stop. All might. Glasses, book, tape, comet, crayon, you are all talking so formally, and this is a freaking chat room. Drop the stupid honorifics already, or we're all gonna get arthritis. There was a long pause, and Midoriya realized that Ishida was right, this was far from a formal conversation. All Might, okay, you're right, Ishido. Crayon, Mina or GTFO. Comet, but didn't Deku make this chat? Crayon, Mina or GTFO. At that point, a new avatar icon appeared, a frog. It didn't take a genius to figure out who that was. Frog. Hi, everyone, Ribbit. All Might. Book. Glasses. Comet. Tape. Did you really just add Ribbit to a text? Frog. It's a habit. Crayon. It's adorable. Suyu. I'm stealing you forever. Comet. No, she's mine, Mina. P. Tape. Should we be worried? Book. So long as no one tries to actually kidnap Suyu, I believe we can let it slide. Midoriya raised an eyebrow. Yeyorazu had paused for a significant amount of time before typing out Asui's first name. Addressing everyone that way would take some time to get used to. All Might, um, back on track. Tape, we had a track at all. All Might, I'm trying to build the track, but Mina seems to be conducting corporate sabotage. Did I really just type that? Midoriya wondered, and then panicked, thinking that he had upset Ishido. Crayon, PFFT. Lol, good one, Deku. Hey, wait, can I call you Deku, like Achako does? PLZ. All Might, I guess so. You're not using it as an insult, so it's fine. Glasses, I noticed that Bakugo kept calling you that, but Achako also says it, and you have no problem. May I ask why? Comet, Bakugo is a big jerk and calls him useless, but I thought it sounded like you can do it. It's nicer than Bakugo's meaning. Glasses, my word. How can Bakugo be so cruel? Tape, yeah, what the hell? Crayon, frog, ribbit. Book, it is obvious that Bakugo has been less than pleasant to Izuku. However, it is good to see that you can take a positive spin on an insult. Good for you, Izuku. All might, thanks, everyone, but can we please drop it? I don't really want to talk about Bakugo, but if you all want to call me Deku, it's fine. None of you seem the type to use it to hurt me. Crayon, on second thought, Ima just call you Midori. Much more fun. Achako can call you Deku, it's cute when she says it. Tape, agreed. On the Achako and Deku thing, I mean. I'm fine with Izuku here, if that's cool. Glasses, I also agree wholeheartedly. Book, frog, ribbit. Tape, okay, now you're just doing that on purpose. Frog, I admit nothing. Tape, don't you dare. Frog, ribbit. Tape, all a job of Fiha. All might, is he okay? Comet, I think Tsu just broke him. Book, well, when Hanta returns from wherever his brain has gone, he can rejoin us. Izuku, aside from getting us all together, was there something you wanted to discuss? All Might, I guess I just wanted to make sure we could all connect like this, maybe help each other out with homework, stuff like that. Glasses, that is a wonderful idea. Maintaining a support network like this is also good practice for when we become pros. The conversation went on like that late into the night, but eventually everyone said their goodbyes and left the chat. Midoriya was the last, and he fell asleep with a smile on his face. The next morning, Midoriya met up with Ida and Uraraka outside the school, only to be nearly crushed by a mob of reporters that were laying siege to the gates. Are you three hero students? One reporter asked, shoving her microphone into Midoriya's face. Have you had classes with All Might? 
What is he like? Enough. Reporters and students alike covered their ears as present Mike used a fraction of his quirk to get their attention. You all know the rules, the hero said when the ringing stopped. His voice was now much friendlier. The press isn't allowed to harass the students, or your networks are gonna get it from our legal team. Now go on, get out of here. The reporters grumbled, but retreated to a respectful distance. Don't worry, listeners, we figured the mob would show up sooner or later. Come on inside and get to class. Thanks, Mike Sensei. Yuraka bowed, and the boys followed suit. Present Mike just grinned and patted Yuraka's head. Don't mention it. Now, you three had better hurry, or Aizawa is gonna get annoyed. Rather than risk their homeroom teacher's wrath, the three moved at just short of a run to make it to class. When they opened the one a door, they found the rest of UAS Rising Stars sitting together, along with Gyro, who was on the other side of Yeyarazu. Hey, guys, Siro greeted. When you weren't here earlier, I thought the paparazzi had gotten you. They almost did, Yuraraka said as she sat down. Luckily, present Mike was there to make them back off. It was kinda scary how they wouldn't leave us alone. Midoriya nodded shakily. He wasn't used to friends being that close to him, let alone total strangers. The press is usually more respectful of Hero's personal space, but I guess All Might being here got them all riled up. The news must be slow or something, Siro said. I mean, I know All Might is popular and all, but isn't him teaching kind of a boring topic? Actually, they once spent three days talking about how his hair was two degrees lower than normal, Midoriya said. When it comes to All Might, they'll take anything and make a huge deal of it. The doors slid open at that moment, and Aizawa stalked inside. That's something you all may risk if you become pro heroes. Thankfully, I'm an underground hero, so I don't have to deal with any of that. He glanced at several of the students who weren't sitting down. You'd all better be seated by the time I blink, or it's detention for all of you. No one was willing to see if he was bluffing, so there was a rush of air as everyone jumped into their seats. Better. Now, All Might gave me a report of everything that happened during his class. For the most part, you all did well, or at least received valuable feedback. I expect to see marked improvements in the coming weeks, but if you don't take honest criticism to heart he paused and looked at Maita, and then back you go. I won't hesitate to expel you. Maita gulped and tried not to make eye contact with the man. Bakugo, who had refused to even look at Midoriya when he came in, scowled and said nothing. Since that's out of the way, there's one more thing you all need to take care of. Aizawa sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose. You need to decide on who's going to be class president and vice president. The class immediately broke out in loud conversation, but then Ida stood up and raised his hand. Everyone, please calm down. Choosing our class leaders should be a respectful and rational affair. He waited until everyone stopped talking. Now then, I believe we should pick our class president and vice president with a vote. Ribbit, isn't that going to be difficult? Asui asked. I mean, we've known each other for less than three days, so we don't really know who's qualified. Yes, but as first impressions are key to almost every interaction, I believe that anyone who has made a good impression will make for fine candidates. He turned to Aizawa. Aizawa sensei, is this acceptable? Fine, so long as you leave me out of it. Aizawa pulled his sleeping bag out from under his desk and crawled inside. I'm taking a nap. With Ida leading things, everyone wrote down a name on a piece of paper and put them into a hat created by Yeyurazu and Ida counted the names. Many people ended up voting for themselves, but two stood out with more than one vote Yeyarazu had four, and Midoriya had three. There we have it, Ida declared. By the number of votes, yeyarazu san is our class president, and Midoriya-san is our vice president. Most of the class gave polite applause except for Bakugo, who just looked infuriated as usual, and the newly elected class leaders walked to the front of the room. This is certainly a surprise, Yeyurazu said, her face colored by an embarrassed blush. I wasn't expecting to be elected class president, but I promise that I will give my all to lead class one to the best of my ability. And I'll do my be best to tea take some of the bee burden off of yeyorazu san Midoriya stammered. Yeyurazu smiled at him. I'll be counting on you, Midoriya. Midoriya only turned red-faced and nodded furiously. Well, that's surprising, Aizawa said from his spot on the floor. I expected you all to take longer. I guess you can make the rest of the class a study period. Just keep the noise down. The students split off into smaller groups, though Midoriya's friends made up the largest. Congratulations, Yamomo, Jiro said, and waved one of her jacks at Midoriya. You too, Vice Press. Yuraka patted Midoriya on the back. Yeah, congrats, Deku-kun. You and Yamomo are gonna be awesome. Midoriya shrugged. I'm not really sure what I'm even supposed to do. It's like you said, Midoriya. Ida said, your task will be to help Yeyarazu bear the weight of her responsibility. 
If she is doing something on behalf of the class, you will assist her. Um, okay. Midoriya gave his usual wobbly smile to the tall girl. Why you can count on me Yamomo. Yayorazu giggled. I appreciate it. No offense, Yamomo, but I kinda thought that you and Midoriya would switch spots, Siro admitted. Everyone was super impressed by him yesterday. It was probably the stuttering, Midoriya muttered, mostly to himself. Nobody wants someone nervous to be in charge. And Yamomo is really cool. Yayorazu shook her head. While I appreciate the compliment, you're being too hard on yourself. Just stop worrying about what other people think. Take it from me. Your harshest critic will always be yourself. TH thanks. Hiroraka smiled at both of them. But on the inside, she was worried about Deku. She was no therapist. But she wasn't stupid. He had said that he'd thought he was quirkless for most of his life. And she was aware of how quirkless people were often treated. She had to wonder if Yue was the first school he'd gone to where people didn't hate him for existing. That won't happen here, she swore to herself. You have friends, Deku-kun. You don't have to be so down on yourself. So, for his sake, she kept up her smile. Nezu normally enjoyed his lunch. It was a time for quiet relaxation when he was alone, or easy conversation when he had company. What he did not enjoy was having that lunch interrupted, especially by an actual emergency. He stared at the security feeds, his lunch forgotten. His gaze was focused on the gaping hole in the wall. The wall of his school, sitting around the table were the senior teachers, as well as All Might. Like Nezu, they were concerned and angry about what had happened someone had turned a section of the outer wall to dust, and set off the level 3 alarms across the school. There were no reports of unauthorized personnel, Hound Dog said through his growls and yips. Either the alarm scared them off, or they got what they wanted, Nezu finished. Until we discover otherwise, we must assume the latter. Assure the students that everything is fine, but I want additional security for all classes. Eraserhead, can I ask you to bring in a few of your underground associates? If they can keep an eye on things from outside, I would appreciate it. Aizawa looked as tired as ever, but his eyes were focused. I have a few people I can call. They'll stay in civilian clothes. If the intruder is still around, they won't want to spook them. Thank you. In addition, I would like you and a few others to accompany Class 1 to the USJ tomorrow, just in case. Aizawa glanced at All Might, and then raised an eyebrow. I'll ask the big three to help out. If there is a problem, we'll have plenty of muscle. But if there isn't, it can be a learning experience for my students. I see no problem with that, Nezu said affably. It might be overkill, but better to be safe than sorry. If there are no other matters, you should all return to your classes, Aizawa, 13, you have preparations to make. The teachers stood and filed out of the room, but Nezu remained in his seat, staring intently at the image of his damaged wall. You've made a mistake, he said, his smile never left his face, but his tone was grim. I can forgive many things, but I do not tolerate an attack on my school. Aside from the panic at lunch, the day went by fairly normally for Class 1A. Midoriya almost found his regular classes boring though Ben spiced it up by providing a running commentary the entire time. After school, Midoriya had done his homework, and then spent some time messaging his friends in UAS Rising Stars. The next day was even less exciting, since there was no alarm. Everyone had become a little more enthusiastic when they were told to get into their costumes for their heroics class. You know, the real Ben would have hated it here. Ben said they headed for the lockers to change into their costumes the students weren't told why, which only increased the apprehension. There were people around, so Midoriya couldn't verbally address Ben's comment. He settled for a raised eyebrow as he got changed. I mean, first of all, these classes are way harder than anything he had when he was your age, Ben went on. And he barely passed those classes, heck, he probably would have failed the written part of the entrance exam. And he wouldn't have liked all the rules that come with being a pro hero. He probably would have become a vigilante on principle. Ben shrugged. I guess I'm just saying that you've got a better handle on life than he did. Midoriya tried not to grin at the compliment, and instead pretended to look busy by cycling through his aliens. Hey, Midoriya. Siro clapped him on the shoulder as he walked past. Think you'll show us some transformations we haven't seen already. Um, maybe. Midoriya shrugged helplessly. It's like Yamomo said during the battle training I need to use the forms that best suit the situation. Yeah, I hear you. Siro tucked his helmet under one arm. I'm kinda jealous, dude, your quirk lets you do so much, but I'm stuck with my tape. Your quirk is awesome, Siro, Midoriya quickly defended. You can use it for mobility, trapping villains, rescuing people, and even first aid. 
Plus, you've had years to figure out how to use your quirk best, and I've had less than one year to learn the basics. And my watch is still sorting out my DNA, so I have to learn even more later. God, just propose if you love his quirk that much, loser, Bakugo grunted as he stalked past. Ciro just shook his head when the blonde boy left. Man, I can't believe anyone can be friends with that jerk. Kirishima must be either really brave or dumb. Wait, Kirishima-san is hanging out with Kakai Mean, Bakugo. Midoriya blinked. When did this happen? I saw them at lunch and they were talking. Siro paused and thought about it. Actually, Kirishima was talking. Bakugo just looked grumpy. Midoriya sighed. For a moment, he had thought that Bakugo had tried to be social. Apparently, Kirishima was reaching out to him. Midoriya wished him luck, but he didn't see Bakugo turning into a social butterfly anytime soon. Anyway, do you have any idea what we're doing today? Siro asked. I'm not sure, Midoriya said as they walked out of the locker room. We did combat training. Maybe they want us to improve on what we know and do it again. That'll keep a lot of the class happy, Siro said. I just hope we don't face the same teams again. Todoroki is way too strong. What's what about Todoroki-san? Yuraraka asked as she and the other girls met up with the boys. He's Opus, Siro said, but sent a grin Todoroki's way to show he was just teasing, though he got no response. Yuraraka nodded, then looked down at herself and pouted. I feel so weird right now. Midoriya could understand why. Uraraka's bodysuit had been torn and her helmet had been almost destroyed. The former had been replaced by her gym uniform, and she was going without the latter. She still had her boots, wrist guards and armored collar, but the bright pink clashed horribly with the gym clothes, and she was stuck with that until the rest of her costume was repaired. Ida bowed low. My apologies once again for yesterday. I didn't mean to cause such harm, nor damage your costume. Uraraka waved him off. No big deal, Ida. I just expected you to only kick, so I wasn't watching out for punches. Now I know better. Ashido patted Uraraka on the back. See, lesson learned. Now come on, or Aizawa-sensei will be mad at us again. To the class surprise, they were directed to a bus outside, where Aizawa was waiting impatiently. We don't have all day, so get on the bus, he ordered. Today, we're focusing on rescue training, and that means we're going on a field trip to a special part of UA. While not met with as much enthusiasm as combat training, many of the students got excited. For some, like Midoriya, Yuraraka, Siro and Nasui, this was why they wanted to become heroes to save people. For the rest, it was a chance to do something new, so everyone quickly got onto the bus. Ida tried to get everyone to sit in neat rows, until he saw that there was only one way everyone could sit. Nasui patted his back consolingly as he sat down next to her. Ooh, I'm so excited. Uraraka bounced in her seat next to Midoriya, who smiled back at her. I know, right. This is why I wanted to be a hero in the first place. Bakugo scoffed. All this rescue crap is for heroes who just can't hack at fighting villains. Asui turned her blank gaze towards him. But you lost during combat training, so what does that say about you, Ribbit? You shut your mouth, frog, Bakugo snarled. No one asked for your opinion. Eh, I know I wouldn't want someone like Bakugo rescuing me, Kaminari said flippantly. No one wants a rescuer with the personality of day old dog crap. You wanna go, Sparky? Bakugo stood up, his glove popping with tiny explosions. Sit down, Aizawa said, his eyes glowing as he stared at the class. Don't antagonize your classmates consider that a warning. And Bakugo, I'm sure you haven't forgotten what I said on the first day of class, right? Bakugo threw himself back in his seat, while the rest of the class sat in more subdued silence. Still, after a few minutes, Yuraraka nudged Midoriya and gave him another excited smile, which he returned. Keep up that smile, Ben said from inside the Ultimatrix. Stay positive, today is going to be a good day. The building the bus took them to was massive, almost as big as the rest of the campus, and if Yuraraka hadn't tugged him along, Midoriya would have spent a while just staring in awe. Of course, as soon as they walked inside and saw who was waiting for them, it was Yuraraka who had to be urged forward. Greetings, said the person in the poofy space suit. Welcome to the Unforeseen Simulation Joint, or USJ for short. Here, you'll find simulations of every disaster scenario imaginable, including floods, ruins, fires, and more. I am 13, and I'll be teaching you the basics of dealing with disasters and today is extra special, because I have some assistance. 13 gestured to the three older teenagers. Please, introduce yourselves. The first to step forward was a tall, muscular boy with short blonde hair. He wore a white costume that was accented by reds, blues, and greens, he had a long red cape, and the number one million on his chest in gold. 
Hey there, freshman. The boy gave them a friendly smile that radiated confidence. I'm Tagata Mirio, but call me Mirio, everyone else does. Oh, but I'm in my costume, so you should call me by my hero name, Lamillion. Ooh, hey everyone. If Midoriya was being objective, the blue-haired girl that jumped forward was even prettier than Yayorazu. She wore a teal bodysuit with mint green markings and yellow gloves. Turquoise spirals ran up her legs, while thicker spirals that looked almost like gauntlets covered her wrists. Part of her hair was done up in spiral-like horns, though that didn't stop the rest from falling down to her knees. I'm Hato Nejire, and my hero name is Nejire Chan. She darted from one one a student to another, her words coming out in a rush. Oh my gosh, you have a bird head. Does that mean you can fly like a bird? Hey, your hair has two colors, that's so awesome. Ooh, I love that ponytail, but I can't get my hair to do that, it's not fair. Aw, those ears on your hoodie are like my hair. I love it. Tagata gently grabbed Hato's hand and pulled her back. Sorry, she gets excited like that. I promise, she's harmless unless you're a villain, and then you're going to have one heck of a hospital bill. He looked over his shoulder. Come on over here and introduce yourself, Amajiki. The third student slouched as he walked over. He wore a black bodysuit that was covered in a white tunic and a vest covered in purple pouches. He also wore a long white cloak with a hood that concealed his dark hair. His eyes were protected by a purple visor. Midoriya also noticed that he was barefoot. I'm Amajiki Tamaki, the boy mumbled, barely loud enough to be heard at all. You can call me Sun Eater, I guess. Aizawa nodded at the three older students. These three are the top students at UA. It's not very creative, but it's why they're called the Big Three. Each of them will be graduating this year, and I wouldn't be surprised if they all had their own hero agencies within their first six months after graduation. He gave his class a stern look. That's what you should all be aiming for the very top. He glanced around and then sighed. All Might was supposed to join us, but since he's running late, we'll start without him. The class groaned in disappointment, but Midoriya suspected why All Might wasn't there. During that fateful meeting on the rooftop, when he had discovered All Might's skinny form, the hero had told him that he could only use his powers for up to about three hours every day. From the way Thirteen briefly held up three fingers and Aizawa's annoyed grimace, All Might must have pushed himself too far today. Regardless, you all have much to learn, Thirteen said. First of all, do any of you know who I am and what I do? For once, someone else beat Midoriya to the punch when it came to hero trivia. Oh, I know. Hiroraka raised her hand and jumped in place. You're the space hero, 13. You use your black hole quirk to rescue people trapped by disasters. 13 nodded. That's true, I have used my quirk to save many lives. However, my quirk is still extremely dangerous, used incorrectly. I could kill the people I try to save. 13's expression was concealed by the helmet, but Midoriya assumed they were all getting a somber look. Never forget that many quirks have the potential to hurt or even kill someone. When it comes to rescuing civilians, your self-control must be greater than ever. That's why you're all here to learn to use your powers to help people. Thank you all for listening. Aizawa nodded in approval. Even the big three had listened to 13 with rapt attention. He was about to throw in his own piece of advice. But then something caught his eye at the bottom of the stairs behind 13 a dark, swirling mass, out of which stepped dozens of people he didn't recognize. His instincts kicked in immediately, and he lowered his gold goggles over his eyes. 13. Get the students back. We're under attack by villains. A vaguely humanoid shape, made of the same black mist, but with yellow eyes, stepped forward and looked up at the heroes. Eraser head and 13. Hum. According to the schedule I received, All Might was supposed to be present. Instead, there are three extra students. Eraserhead scowled. It looks like they were responsible for yesterday. They planned this. Midoriya and many other students were starting to panic. Today was only the fourth day of school, and villains were attacking them. Easy, Ben said in Midoriya's ear. Deep breaths. Stay calm. See if anyone can call for help. Midoriya was often told to take a breath whenever he was about to be overwhelmed. As usual, the breathing techniques helped. There are a lot of them down there, he said, just loud enough to be heard. Can anyone contact the rest of the school? An excellent suggestion, Midoriya San, 13 said, and pressed a button on their helmet. Unfortunately, all I'm getting is static, they must be jamming communications. Since no alarms are going off, they must also have disabled those. Midoriya took another breath. Then someone needs to get outside and find help. Of course, as soon as he said that, the massive doors behind them suddenly closed. First, we need to get the door open. None of you are going anywhere, said a new voice. It belonged to a young man with unhealthy skin. He wore black, almost casual clothing, though his arms and face were covered with what looked like severed hands. He also had two more clasped around his neck. 
Behind him was a hulking brute, with dark skin intersected with red scars, a bird-like head with lidless eyes and an exposed brain. No one leaves until I see all might, the man said. The League of Villains came all this way to kill the symbol of peace maybe some dead kids will draw him out. Ha! Huh. Some bosses only spawn once the mobs are killed. He nodded to himself, and then turned to the missed villain. Kirajiri, let's start the game. The racer had loosened his capture tool and ran down the stairs. Lamillion, you're with me. Nejire Chan, Sun Eater, stay with 13 and protect the students. Without a word, the big three readied themselves. Nejire Chan gathered spiraling energy around her hands, while more spirals on her feet pushed her into the air. Sun Eater opened two of his pouches and tossed something into his mouth. A moment later, his hands became enormous tentacles, while his feet transformed into talons. But it was Lamillion who surprised Midoriya the most. After a moment of concentration. The older boy was suddenly covered in crackling golden energy, and his veins glowed red. He pushed off from the ground, directly at the villains, and practically vanished. He's so fast. Midoriya blinked, and then Lamillion was ahead of Eraserhead, driving a fist into the first villain he came across. And he's strong it's almost like looking at a less powerful All Might. You think you can defeat us? The missed villain, Kirajiri, chuckled as he appeared in their midst from out of another portal. Perhaps in a large group, but it will be far easier to pick you off if you're spread out. Unfortunately for you, we've already sent out teams of our own to welcome you to your deaths. Not if I stop you first. Nejire Chan pointed her arms at the villain and fired off two spirals of energy. How boring. Hirajiri barely glanced at the girl before opening two more portals. The first swallowed her attack, while the second, positioned over the class, sent it straight down. Look out, Midoriya slammed down the Ultimatrix dial without thinking and jumped in the way of the blast. Humongousaur, now 12 feet tall, the brown-skinned dinosaur-like creature was one of Midoriya's favorites. He had gone through a costume change since the first time turning into him. He now wore black shorts, including a hole for his long tail, and a green bandolier that held the Ultimatrix dial. He quickly brought up one arm to block the blast before it could hit Ishido and Shoji. Human Gausser winced in pain, but shook it off, he'd had worse from Bakugo. Besides, he now turned an angry gaze at Kirajiri. You are in so much trouble, he growled in a voice so deep that it shook bones. Only if you can touch me, Kirajiri countered. For now be gone. Human Gausser's eyes widened, and he swept his arms out as gently as he could to push the other students away. Get back. Unfortunately, he wasn't fast enough, many of his classmates were snatched up by the portals, including himself. The last thing he heard before the darkness claimed him was a familiar, panicked voice. Deku-kun, Yuraka glared at Kirajiri. She didn't normally get angry, but this villain had just sent many of her friends to who knew where. Where did you send them? She demanded. I already told you, there are many of my associates who are waiting to get their hands on would-be heroes. Kirajiri shrugged. I would have preferred to get all of you, but such is life. Too bad for you, 13 said, stepping between the younger students and the villain. Class 1A, as one of your instructors, I am giving you the following order, you must get the door open, so that Ida-san can get help. Your seniors and I will hold off this one. Yuraka glanced at who was left, only she, Ashido, Ida, Shoji and Siro had avoided capture. Deku-kun probably kept us safe, she thought. I can't let what he did be for nothing. Mina, she said quietly, can you melt the door? Or at least make a hole big enough for Ida. Ashido looked at the door in question. Yeah, but it'll take a minute, even with my most corrosive acid. She grimaced. And doing that can hurt even me if I'm not careful. Then we'll make sure you don't lose your concentration, Yuraka said. Ida, watch her back, the rest of us will keep you two covered. As soon as you get an opening, you run and you don't stop until you find help, okay? Ida hesitated, likely because he didn't want to leave his classmates, but ultimately, he nodded. I will, I promise. As if I'd let you, Kirajiri said, only to be blocked by thirteen and two-thirds of the big three. Please, you already know that I can send back anything you throw at me. I guess we'll just have to try harder, Nejire Chan said with a playful smile, and her hands glowed with charging power. I'll just send it right back, Kirajiri said, and created another portal in front of him. Of course, with his vision blocked, he didn't see the giant tentacle until it crashed into his side specifically. It hit the metal brace around his neck. Gah, what? Ha, huh? made you look. Nejire Chan smiled at her friend. Nice work, Sun Eater. Despite his success, Sun Eater looked like he was about to panic. That move won't work twice, we need to get rid of those portals. I'm on it, 13 said, and raised a pointer finger at the villain. The cap at the end of the glove popped off, and the world's most powerful vacuum switched on. The black mist was sucked up, and the air seemed to get a bit less stifling. 
We've got you covered, students. Go, Ashido nodded grimly, and then placed her palms on the door, acid gathered around her hands, and immediately ate away at the material. However, Ashido's hands began to burn and blister after only about a minute of her maximum corrosion. Yeah, this kinda sucks, she said through gritted teeth, but I think it'll only take a few more minutes. Shoji had turned one of his hands into an eye to watch her, and that eye narrowed in concern. Ashido-san, are you sure you can do this? Well, huh? She spat out. I've got some immunity to my acid. If I didn't, I wouldn't have hands anymore. I'll have some bad burns when this is over, but I've given myself worse by accident. True enough, though her pink skin turned red and raw, there was a hole leading to the outside after only a few minutes. It would be a tight fit, but Ida was ready. I'll be back soon. He shouted over the roar of his engines. Engine boost. No. Tirajiri tried to stop him, but a wave of tape and tentacles blocked his path. Curses. Uraraka pumped a fist in triumph. Go, Ida. I believe in you. She glanced worriedly at the rest of the USJ. I just have to believe in everyone else, too. The first thing Human Gausser saw when he emerged from the portal was water. At first, he thought Kirajiri had sent him to the ocean. But the he saw the inside of the USJ dome, and realized that he hadn't been sent very far. Then he hit the water, sending a huge geyser upwards. The impact didn't do much to his thick hide, but Human Gausser had sunk pretty far under the water, and he wasn't suited for this kind of terrain. More importantly, he saw a familiar purple figure in the water with him, surrounded by several villains with water-based quirks. He slapped the dial once more. When the green light faded, he was now a tall fish creature with webbed claws, huge jaws and teeth, and a lure that curled over his head. The Ultimatrix dial was set on a piece of armor on his shoulder, the only clothes he had. His legs sealed together to form a fish's tail, and he glared at the underwater villains. Rip jaws. He swam at incredible speeds, and drove his fist into the face of a villain before he could get his hands on Maita. That arm still hurt from when he blocked Nejire Chan's quirk, but it wasn't anything he couldn't handle. The small boy panicked when Rip jaws turned to face him, but then he noticed the familiar dial and smiled. Unfortunately, he accidentally let in some water, and he began to drown. Ripjaws reached out to grab him, but another villain tackled him from the side. For a moment, Ripjaws panicked, unsure of how to get past the villain before Maita drowned. Thankfully, he didn't have to think long. A familiar tongue wrapped around Maita, and the tongue's owner gave Ripjaws a thumbs up as she swam to the boat that floated at the surface. Thanks, Tsuyu, Ripjaws thought, and then slashed his attacker across the chest to drive him back. He then quickly swam after his classmates, who were already on the boat. What is happening right now? Minda screamed, once he'd finished coughing. Villains are attacking us. Villains, this is only our fourth day of school. I didn't think we'd have to deal with this so soon. We're gonna die. I'm gonna die. And I'll never see Yeyorazu naked. Asui grimaced. I can't believe I touched you with my tongue. You did what heroes do, Asui I mean. Tsuyu, Ripjaws said in his deep, raspy voice as he pulled himself aboard and his tail split back into legs. Great work. Thanks. Asui scooted back to put Rip Jaws between herself and Maita. I still want mouthwash, Ribbit. High on adrenaline, Rip Jaws almost made a joke at Maita's expense. Instead, he started gasping. Asui was immediately at his side. Midoriya, are you okay? Instead of immediately answering, Rip Jaws slapped the Ultimatrix dial and turned into swamp fire, and then took a long breath of air. S sorry I can't breathe out of water when I'm Ripjaws. Oh, okay. Asui looked out over the water, where the villains circled like hungry sharks. What do we do now, Ribbit? Swamp Fire rubbed his arm as it healed. I'm working on that. What did you say? Gyro shouted over the sound of fighting. I said that I'm working on a plan. Yeyorazu yelled back as she ducked under a villain's outstretched hand. That hand was soon broken after a few well-placed blows, and its owner reeled back in pain. Kaminari tackled another villain to the ground and delivered a jolt of electricity to his head. Damn, Yamomo, yeah, where did you learn to do that? It's a long story. Actually, it was rather simple Yeyorazu was a rich, pretty girl, and as such, she knew that she would have to defend herself, especially if she wanted to be a hero. Thankfully, her parents were very understanding, and had hired some of the best self-defense instructors available to teach her. That had been three years ago, and she was more than capable of handling thugs like these. Skilled as she was, she still couldn't see in every direction, so she was taken by surprise when another villain slammed her into a boulder. One hand was wrapped around her throat, while the other transformed into a serrated hook. You ain't gonna look so pretty after I'm done, the villain said with a leer, made all the more unpleasant by an abnormally long tongue. That tongue reached out for her ear, only for it to be pierced by a long needle that emerged from Yeyorazu's cheek. The villain's scream was particularly loud, 
but it was cut off when Yeirazu created a metal fist on a spring-loaded mechanism that burst from her stomach and into his diaphragm. He let go and fell to the ground with a wheeze. Just for good measure, she created a metal staff from her arm and drove it between the villain's eyes. There's too many of them, Gyro shouted. We need a way to take out all these losers. I can do that, Kaminari replied. But I'll zap you too if I do. Yeirazu took stock of the situation she, Gyro and Kaminari were unharmed, barring a few scrapes and bruises, while over a dozen villains were unconscious on the ground. Unfortunately, for every one they took down, two more took their place. Gyro seems fine, as does Kaminari, Yeyorazu thought. My stores of lipids are a little low. My costume is a bit torn at the center. I really should ask the support department if they can make something better focus, Momo. How can Kaminari use his quirk without hurting Gyro and I? Oh, I know. Gyro-chan, get over here. Yeyorazu fell to her hands and knees, focusing her quirk on her back. A moment later, a thick blanket burst out, shredding her costume and draining her lipids. But it was worth it as she dragged Gyro underneath the blanket with her. This is a sheet of insulation, Kaminari. We'll be fine. Hit them with everything you've got. Kaminari grinned at the villains, while thick bolts of electricity sparked wildly around him. Badass. Okay, you bastards, take this. Indiscriminate shock. 1.3 million volts. There was a bright flash of light and the smell of ozone. But when Yeirazu's vision cleared, all of the villains were down. Excellently done. Uh, Yamomo. Gyro blushed as she pointed at her more specifically, at the scraps of cloth that did nothing to preserve Yeirazu's dignity. Yeirazu sighed. Do you think you can check on Kaminari-san while I make some new clothes? Yeah, okay. Gyro crawled out from under the blanket. Hey, stupid. Did you fry your brain, or hey? Don't you dare look over there. Yeirazu chuckled as she shed the remains of her old costume and created a new one. As useful as he would have been, I'm glad that Midoriya isn't here right now. He can barely look me in the eye seeing me like this probably would have killed him. Thinking about her friend quickly sobered her mood. I hope he's okay. I hope everyone is okay. Okay, I have a plan, Swamp Fire said. It shouldn't take too long to pull off, either. That's good, Asui said, then glanced over her shoulder. Does it involve him, Ribbit? Swamp Fire looked sympathetically back at Maita. The boy was pressed into a corner as far as he could go, trembling and muttering denials. He was on the verge of complete panic, if he hadn't crossed that threshold already. No, but we do need to get him out of there. Swamp Fire shrugged apologetically. You're going to have to pick him up, though. Asui's only sign of reluctance was a small sigh. Okay, but you owe me mouthwash. Deal. Despite the danger they were in, Swamp Fire shared a smile with the girl. Anyway, the plan is simple on my signal. You're going to take Minta and jump for the shallow end of the shipwreck zone. You'll need to stay in the air as long as possible, just in case, so you'll need to make a pretty high jump. No problem, Ribbit. Asui started to trace an arc, starting from the deck of the ship. I've got the proportional strength of any frog, and that includes the best jumpers. I could probably stay in the air for about 8 seconds at my best. Swamp Fire glanced at Ben, who had been silently observing. The hologram flickered as he ran some calculations, and then nodded to confirm his idea. That should be more than enough time, he said. Just give me a second to change. Asui raised an eyebrow. Should I turn around? Wa seriously. Sorry, smart comments help me stay calm. Ribbit. Swamp Fire couldn't help but chuckle. How does she say stuff like that with a straight face? I hope she never plays poker or something. All right, grab Minta and get ready to go. As soon as the villains see the light, they'll know something is up. Swamp Fire slapped the dial on his chest and vanished in a flash of green. Shock Squatch. This new alien was tall and muscular, and mostly covered in yellow hair, though the hair around his head, wrists, and feet was black. He had what looked like metal studs coming out of his wrists, and three horns on his brow that looked like lightning bolts. He wore a pair of green pants, with the Ultimatrix dial acting as the buckle for his belt. Good luck, Midoriya, Asui called, and then wrapped her tongue around Maita. Come on, you. With an impressive jump, Asui carried the screaming boy high into the air. As soon as her feet left the deck, Shock Squatch grabbed the nearest railing a metal railing and waved at the villains. You guys are in for a shock, eh? Shock Squatch grinned as his hair crackled with electricity and then sent all that power through the boat. A moment later, everything in the water was fried by obscene amounts of electricity. The villains floated to the surface, their bodies blackened by electrical burns. Hey, you used a pun. Ben grinned at him. I mean, it wasn't anything original, but it was a classic. The real Ben probably would have approved. Thanks, Shock Squatch grunted. Hey, you said this one could jump far, right? Not as far as Asui, but yeah. 
then raised an eyebrow. I wouldn't do that, though. Shock Squatch gets shorted out in water. Oh, good to know, eh? Shock Squatch leaped off the ship as far as his powerful legs could carry him, and then tapped the dial on his belt just before he hit the water. Diamond Head. I hope Midoriya is okay. Asui commented as she and Minta swam for shore. Are you kidding? He went up against real villains by himself. He's dead, and all he did was buy us a few minutes. It was hard to tell if the water in Minda's eyes was tears or just from splashes. Asui glanced back. I think you should turn around and find out for yourself, Ribbit. No way, Minda shouted, flailing his fists wildly. If I turn around, I'll be a sitting duck for those villains, I just know it. Do I really look like a villain to you? This new voice was a fine bass, but since Minda had never heard it before, he opened his mouth to scream. Thankfully for Asui's ears, a light green crystalline hand covered the boy's mouth. Please, don't do that, we're trying to be sneaky. Trembling, Minta turned and saw the large humanoid figure holding him. He was a good deal taller than Asui, so he was able to stand in the shallower water, while his head and shoulders were still clear. Most of his body was covered by a dark blue bodysuit, but his large arms were exposed, as was his craggy head. If his arms and head were any indication... His entire body seemed to be made of living diamond. He also had two large spikes of the same material poking out from his shoulder blades, and on his chest was the same hourglass dial. Midoriya, Minda asked, his voice muffled until the hand was removed from his face. You're alive. How? And what does this one do? In order yes, I electrocuted the villains with shock squatch, and I call this one Diamond Head. I'm really tough, and can do some cool stuff with crystals. Oh. Asui tapped a forefinger against her chin. You know, we could have gotten the same effect with Kaminari. All we'd have to do is push him into the water. Diamond Head nodded. We should probably tell him that, and he can turn into an expert against water-based villains. How are you too? So, calm, Minta demanded. We're students, for crying out loud. We shouldn't have to deal with this crap in our first week of school. Why aren't you freaking out? Asui and Diamond Head shared a look, and then the former spoke. I guess I just know there's no point in panicking. Diamond Head shrugged. I'm pretty sure if I start panicking, I won't be able to stop. He sighed. I'll freak out when we're not in danger. Minta shook his head. You two are freaks. Let's just get out of here and HMMPH. Diamond had shut him up with a hand over his mouth again. SHH. Do you hear that? Sui cupped a hand around her ear. Sounds like fighting, Ribbit. Yeah. Come on, let's go check it out. When Minda started thrashing in his arms, Diamond Head gave him a stern look. We're not going to fight if we don't have to, but if it's some of our class, we need to help them. If we don't need to get involved, we'll just sneak around and head back to the entrance. After a moment, Miter reluctantly nodded. The three crept up to the rocky perimeter of the shipwreck zone and beheld a pile of defeated villains. Most of them were moaning in pain, while others were obviously knocked out a few, though, were unnaturally still. Asui pointed at those particular bodies, though her expression remained unchanged. She'd gone a few shades paler. There's Diamond Head took a deep breath. There's a reason underground heroes don't get much media attention. They're the ones more likely to be in a situation where they might have to kill someone. Does that mean that Eraserhead is nearby? Asui asked. She didn't voice the possibility that one of their classmates had taken lives. There was a loud grunt, and then a familiar figure hurtled past. He was battered and broken, but there was no mistaking Eraserhead as he fell to a crumpled heap. Not bad. Eraserhead, the villain with the hands said as he stepped over the bodies of his henchmen. It took me longer than I'd like to figure out your combos. The devs must have put some extra work into your speed, because it was hard to track. Then again, you do work better with a party, and I had to divide my pawns to handle that blonde kid both of you are definitely miniboss material. But unfortunately for you, you're up against two specced out players. He paused as he walked over to Eraserhead and slowly turned to face the three students. You know, I love using aggro moves on enemies with only a few HP left. It adds a bit of drama to the system. So, how would you like to watch your precious students crumble away to dust? Crumble to dust. Diamond Head's eyes went wide. Was he the one who destroyed part of the wall yesterday? With a quick jump, the villain was upon them, and his hand reached out for Asui's face. No, Diamond had put his arm out, and the villain's hand grabbed him instead of Asui. Get away from her. Taking damage for a weaker party member isn't a bad strategy for a tank, the villain said. Too bad my quirk bypasses all defenses. To Diamond Head's horror, the outer edge of his arm began to crumble away. He didn't feel the pain, but he also didn't want to find out how much damage he could take. Thinking quickly, he aimed his other arm at the villain, his hand shifted into what looked like an oversized meat tenderizer, and then fired a burst of crystal shards at him. 
The villain's reaction time was incredible. Only a few shards struck him in the arm before he pulled back. As soon as he let go of Diamond Head's arm, the decay halted. You're not getting away, Diamond Head growled, even as his damaged arm began to reform. Asui, mind to get Eraserhead out of here. I'll cover you. Rather than argue, Asui jumped past and grabbed Eraserhead with her tongue. Mindu was right behind her, and did his best to hold up his teacher's legs so that he wasn't dragged. Well, that's annoying, the villain said. I only took a little damage to my temporary HP from Eraserhead, but you actually hurt me. I guess you can help Namu build up some combo points for his fight with All Might. He tilted his head up and raised his voice. Namu, ignore the blonde brat and get over here. There was a roar from behind Diamond Head. He turned and saw the brute from before Namu. He assumed charging straight at him. Running behind the monster was Lamillion. The third year looked unharmed. But even his incredible speed was no match for Namu's. Freshman, get out of here. Lamillion cried. He's too strong. With nowhere to run, Diamond Head just braced himself. If Tagata Mirio could be summed up in a word, it would be earnest. If a second word was allowed, it would probably be humble. He wasn't someone who boasted about his own abilities, if anything. He downplayed what he could do, because he considered so many other people, students and heroes alike, to be better than him. When All Might chose him as his successor, Tagata had tried to refuse. He was positive that someone was a better fit, and had rattled off a dozen names, just to prove a point. But All Might didn't back down, and showed him a long list of the students' achievements as an intern. It didn't escape Tagata's notice that that list had been provided by Sir Night Eye. You've done more with your natural abilities in your first two years at UA than I did with my inherited power. All Might had said, You're strong, you've got a good head, and most importantly, you have a good heart. Believe me, if I didn't think you were worthy, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Tagata could admit that his heart had swelled with pride though the moment was ruined when All Might suddenly reverted back to his skinny form and spat out an alarming amount of blood. When confronted with All Might's fading health, Tagata reluctantly accepted the power of one for all. That had been several months ago, and he was now starting to get a handle on his increased strength. At least, he thought he had. But the limited amount of power he could use was barely enough to catch Namu's attention. The best he'd been able to do was distract him so that he didn't smash Eraserhead's face into the ground. His best punches had done nothing, even when he pulled a risky move and tried hitting the monster's exposed brain. At least he had been able to avoid injury and return as powerful as Namu was. All Lamillion had to do was use his natural quirk, permeation. Neither fighter could hurt the other, but as Namu responded to his master's summons, Lamillion couldn't stop him, either. Maybe I can at least get Midoriya out of there. He thought as he channeled all the power he could safely manage so that he could increase his speed. Unfortunately, Namu was even faster if that Shigaraki guy was telling the truth. Then Namu was capable of fighting a fully powered All Might. He tried to get Midoriya because who else could that crystal guy be? To get out of the way. Instead, Midoriya placed his hands on the ground. A moment later, huge spikes of crystal formed a barricade between him and the charging Namu. If Midoriya had thought his barrier would dissuade Namu, he was mistaken. The monster's momentum was only halted when the sharp spikes pierced deep into his body. Lamillion winced. Causing those kinds of injuries could give even experienced heroes some trauma, let alone a first-year student. Still, it looked like Namu had caused his own defeat, so. Not bad, Shigaraki said calmly, as if his trump card hadn't just been impaled. If that was anyone else, they'd be crippled, or even killed. Too bad for you, Namu is no ordinary villain. Without a word escaping the monster's mouth, Namu pulled himself free of the spikes, as Lamillion watched in horrified fascination. Torn organs and muscles knitted back together, and skin quickly grew over that. In seconds, Namu looked like he had never been injured at all. Well, that's a problem, Lamillion said as he dashed over to Midoriya. Yeah, I know. It was strange seeing a man made of diamond take a deep breath like a nervous schoolchild, but that was what happened. From what I can tell, he's got super speed, some kind of shock absorption, and rapid regeneration. And crazy strength, Lamillion added, while keeping one eye on Shigaraki. I'd say he has multiple quirks, which is impossible, but look at you. Oh, but he does have multiple quirks. Shigaraki laughed. He was designed to be the perfect counter to All Might, the anti-symbol of peace. Lamillion and Midori tensed as a black portal opened up next to Namu, and Kirajiri stepped out. Where have you been? My apologies, Shigaraki Tamura but I was waylaid by several students, as well as thirteen, at the entrance. Kirijiri looked unharmed, though the metal collar he wore was scratched and dented. They were able to help one of their own escape, and going by how fast he could move, I believe that the heroes will arrive soon. We should withdraw. You want to run away? 
Shigaraki scoffed as he made his way over to his allies. We haven't even cleared the minibuses yet, much less All Might. These small fries might be able to handle the pawns, but they're no match for overleveled players like us, especially Namu. Man, this guy is cocky, Lamillion said, and then glanced at Midoriya. I don't think we can get away without a fight. Then I guess we have to fight. Midoriya's hands tightened into fists. I have an idea, but it's risky, and it's not foolproof, but it's all I have right now. I'm all ears, Lamillion said. Hitting them doesn't seem to work, so if you've got another option. I do. The problem is, I can only do this alone. Well, I'm not leaving my junior behind, Lamillion said, his voice brooked no disagreement. You'll have to come up with another plan. Are you two done talking? Shigaraki asked. I've been playing nice so far, but your strategy meeting is going a little long. Namu, get their attention. Namu took a step forward, but then froze literally as ice crept up his legs. A moment later, huge explosions bombarded the area. I told you to stay out of my way, icy hot. I can handle these weaklings on my own. I didn't hear any complaining when I helped you earlier, because I was busy beating the crap out of some punk who tried to jump me. Lamillion scratched his head, bemused, as Bakugo and Todoroki stepped into view, neither looked injured, but the arguing was almost comical. Behind them, Kirishima didn't seem to think so. Come on, guys, you can argue when we're not fighting villains. Oh, hey, Midoriya, that's a new one. Uh, yeah, I call this one Diamond Head. I like it. Kirishima straightened when he saw the older student. Lamillion, are you okay? I'm good, don't worry. Lamillion turned back to face the villains. These guys are going to be a problem. Not if this works, Diamond Head said. You wanted me to come up with another plan, Lamillion. Well, I think I can now make the first one work. He then slapped the dial on his chest. Once the green light faded, Lamillion saw a tall figure that seemed to be made of living magma. His oversized hands glowed almost white hot, while fire burned around his head. Heat blast. Lamillion put a few more feet between him and Midoriya's new form. Even at this distance, he'd started to sweat from the heat. Shigaraki stared, wide-eyed as he saw what happened. That's not possible. Did he just go from tank to DPS? He can swap specializations and elemental bonuses. Nobody naturally has that kind of variety in quirks. That's just... That's not fair. Lamillion almost laughed as Shigaraki ranted. If it weren't for his deadly quirk, he'd have a hard time believing that the man wasn't all talk. Still, Lamillion dragged his attention back to Midoriya, who had turned to the other students. Todoroki-san, Heat Blast said in a low, gravelly voice, I have an idea, but I need your help to make it work. That big guy might actually be a match for All Might in terms of pure physical power. Todoroki kept his surprise limited to wider eyes. But you have a plan to stop him. Yeah, it's pretty simple. Actually, you put a wall of ice between you all and me, and you don't stop making that ice until I'm done. No way, Midoriya. Hiroshima looked nervous, but he didn't back down. We can't let you fight that freak on your own. You're going to have to, Heat Blast said grimly, because I can't be sure this move won't kill you guys by mistake. You're not planning what I think you're planning, are you? You're going to have to, Heat Blast said, ignoring Ben for the moment, because I can't be sure this move won't kill you guys by mistake. Oh my god, you are. Ben wasn't visible at the moment, but his disapproval was obvious. This is a bad idea, Izuku. If you get this wrong, even a little, you could kill everyone within a square mile of this place. Heat Blast responded by way of aiming his hands at Namu. Ben sighed. All right, if you're really sure, I'll monitor your output and make sure you don't fry the entire school, okay? You've had a lot of back-to-back -back transformations. Between that and the power you're planning on using, you've got maybe five minutes left. Good luck, Todoroki, Heat Blast said, now. Todoroki either thought his classmate knew what he was doing, or otherwise didn't have a better idea, because he stomped down with his right foot, and a massive wall of ice separated Heat Blast from the other students. He just hoped that it was enough. Deku, Bakugo shouted, You think you're really tough enough to fight a guy meant to fight All Might? You're such an idiot. If you die to this freak, I'm killing you myself. Then chuckled, a little disbelieving. If I didn't know better, I'd say he almost sounded worried. Somehow, I doubt it, Heat Blast thought. No time to think about it now, though. All right, villains, he said out loud, time to see if you're just all talk. Shigaraki rolled his eyes. Cocky little punk, aren't you? I don't care who you are or that you have multiple quirks. You're not on All Might's level, which means you aren't on Namu's. You'll be dead in a second anyway, so I don't even care that your quirk is weird. Heat Blast gave the best smile he could manage. Then come get me. Namu, kill him. Namu stalked towards Heat Blast, who unleashed two columns of fire from his hands that splashed against the monster's chest. The skin turned crispy and burned off, only for it to grow back just as quickly. Did you forget that he could regenerate? Shigaraki mocked. 
No, I didn't, but I'm just getting warmed up. Two puns. Ben laughed. You're on a roll today. I've seen regeneration quirks before, and I've read papers on them. Heat blast thought. They take a toll on the body, just like recovery girls quirk. Quirks are biological functions, which means that there's a limit to how much energy they can expend before shutting down. I have to force this guy to heal so much that he exhausts himself. And so, Heat Blast increased the firepower he was using, slowly at first, then faster and faster, until the heat burned away the oxygen around him in a screaming hiss. The pressure from the intense blaze slowed Namu's progress, but he wasn't stopping therefore, neither could Heat Blast. Ben had taught Midoriya about this move, but only the theory of it, it was incredibly dangerous, and they had nowhere to safely practice. Still, Midoriya had an instinctive handle on at least the basics of his alien's powers, and his mind was sharp enough to put theory into practice. More heat, he thought fiercely, more fire. Come on, push yourself to the limit of what you can safely do. The fires around Heat Blast had long stopped being a reddish-orange, now they were a blinding white, but he still kept going. Todoroki wanted to just stop and stare. He knew fire-based quirks better than most, but he'd never seen anyone use that much power and not kill themselves. Not even Endeavor had ever pulled off a move like that, and Midoriya was using even more. Guys, I think we're about to be busy. Todoroki glanced over his shoulder at Kirishima's shout. Some of the villains that Eraserhead and Lemillion had beaten were starting to get back up, and more who hadn't fought were charging towards them as well. Bakugo, who had been glaring at Midoriya this whole time, gritted his teeth. Fuck. Fine, we'll take care of these weaklings. Icy hot. Keep up that shitty wall so that that idiot Deku doesn't roast us. Hiroshima charged first, while Bakugo flew overhead to start the fight. Before he left, Lamillion gave Todoroki a thumbs up. Good work, freshman. Just keep an eye on Midoriya, okay? We'll cover you. Todoroki nodded, and then turned back to Midoriya's fight. He still refused to break his oath to use his fire in combat, but today, he had a workaround. Normally, he could only use so much ice before he suffered frostbite. He avoided that by ending fights as quickly as possible, and then used his fire to warm himself up. However, the heat Midoriya was putting out was so intense that it was melting his ice as quickly as he could make it. Theoretically, he could keep this up almost indefinitely. Be careful, Midoriya, he whispered. I don't know what your limit is in that form, but I think you're reaching it. Let's see how you handle this. Heat Blast shouted as he pushed past what he considered completely safe and unleashed a true firestorm. Nova Flight Air. There was a primordial roar as a fraction of a supernova was channeled in a straight line. The light was blinding, and when it faded, Heat Blast fell to his knees, his fires had dimmed, and he was panting heavily. He looked up to view his handiwork, and was shocked. Starting at where he stood, a huge furrow had been carved into the ground, all the way to the domed wall of the USJ. Rather than burn dirt, the trench he had carved was made of molten glass. Standing in the middle of that trench was Namu, the monster had shielded his head with his arms, but the rest of his body was a dull black, which then started to crumble away like charcoal, until only his head fell to the ground intact. Heat Blast stared in horror, unable to do anything else, as the Ultimatrix timed out from using so much power. Midoriya was snapped back into full awareness when the superheated ground under him started to burn through his clothes and into his skin he quickly scrambled back to the edge of what he had done, though not before earning burns on his feet, knees, and hands. He was about to stumble towards Todoroki, but then heard a noise that sounded like tearing meat. He turned, and saw that Namu's entire body was starting to regenerate from the neck down. It took almost a full minute, but the monster stood back up, without a single mark. No, Midoriya fell backwards and tried to get away. That's impossible. Namu took a step towards him, and then another and then collapsed, and didn't get up again. It worked, Midoriya thought with no small amount of relief. He was able to recover from the damage, but regenerating that much must have overtaxed his body. Namu, amazingly, Shigaraki and Kirijiri were still standing, though the former looked like he had a bad sunburn, and the latter's metal collar was warped from the heat. Namu, get up. The boss battle hasn't started yet, you can't disconnect now. He glared at Midoriya. You, you did this. You cheated. I don't know how, but you must have cheated. Shigaraki Tamura Kirijiri reached out, but Shigaraki batted him away. I'm gonna kill you, cheater. Shigaraki charged at Midoriya, hands outstretched to turn him into dust. I had the perfect plan to kill All Might, and you ruined it. Midoriya was exhausted, hurt, unable to transform, and now he was terrified. Shigaraki had never seemed like the most stable person in the world 
but now he was a grown man with the power to kill with a touch in the throes of a temper tantrum. Shigaraki was mere feet away from Midoriya when the USJ doors slammed open more than that. They were ripped clean off their hinges. Stay back, villain. Midoriya blinked, and suddenly, All Might was there, standing between him and Shigaraki. Instead of his costume, he was wearing his yellow pants and white shirt. You won't harm anyone else today. All Might. Hirajiri created a portal, just as the hero threw a punch. Shigaraki, get back. Texas before All Might could finish one of his special moves, another blur tackled him to the side. What? Young Mirio, what are you doing? Stopping you from making a big mistake. Lamillion panted as he fell to one knee. Oh, must have pushed myself too hard there. Anyway, if you'd punched into that portal. He pointed behind him. All Might glanced back and saw the other portal hovering behind Midoriya. It didn't take him long to figure out what he had almost done. Ah, I see. My thanks, Lamillion. He turned back to the villains. Your mission is over, criminals. From what I can see, your pawns have all been defeated, and your big friend over there is down for the count. Surrender peacefully, and since none of my students were permanently injured, I'll put in a good word with the authorities. Are you pitying me? Shigaraki's shoulders trembled. Don't you dare pity me, symbol of peace. Everything I ever suffered is because of you, and heroes like you. I promise you, I am going to kill you, All Might, but now, I'll make sure you watch as I turn everything you love to dust. All Might just raised an eyebrow. Not from Tartarus, you won't. Shigaraki grinned behind the hand on his face. Only if you catch me. Kurajiri. All Might reached out, but a dozen portals surrounded Shigaraki and Kurajiri in a dome, protecting them as another portal swallowed the pair up. Watch your back, All Might, Shigaraki taunted. I want you to see it all coming. The portals faded, leaving All Might to ponder the villain's words, until a hiss of pain from Midoriya pushed it all to the back of his mind. He could worry about the villains later, right now, he had an injured student. Don't worry, young Midoriya, he said, and gently scooped the boy up into his arms. I am here. Midoriya tried and failed to stop the tears that finally caught up with him. Th thank you, All Might. All Might glanced at Lamillion, who jerked a thumb at Namu and shook his head. No, young Midoriya I think I should be the one thanking you. With All Might and the other teacher's arrival, the remaining villains were quickly captured, and the students were gathered together at the entrance of the USJ. Police officers arrived a few minutes later to take the criminals into custody and to collect statements, while paramedics worked to help anyone who needed it. Yuraraka, now trembling as her adrenaline faded, was hugging Ida in thanks. The boy had pushed himself to his absolute limit, and his engines were still smoking. He stiffly returned the embrace, though his smile was genuine and warm. Is everyone all right, Yuraraka? He asked, and then limped over to a nearby bench to sit down. I'm not sure, Yuraraka admitted. Ashido burned herself pretty bad with her acid, but she's already being taken to recovery girl. Aizawa sensei looked bad, though. The teachers are still gathering up everyone else oh my god, Deku-kun. Everyone who heard her voice turned to see All Might carrying Midoriya in his arms. The boy had ugly burns on his hands and knees, and his shoes had been melted through to his feet. Behind them came Lamillion, who was limping, along with Kirishima, Todoroki and Bakugo, though those three looked unhurt. I am all right, Midoriya stammered as All Might placed him on a stretcher. I just need to wait for my watch to recharge, and then I can heal myself with swamp fire. Principal Nezu turned from his conversation with a detective. Are you sure, Midoriya-san? When Midoriya nodded, Nezu looked satisfied. Very well, that's one less patient for recovery girl. Todoroki-san, could you please provide him with some ice to cool those burns until he can transform? Todoroki nodded and created a rough chair out of ice for Midoriya. Lamillion gave both boys a thumbs up and then limped over to Nejire chan and Sun Eater. How is everyone? He asked, Sun Eater slumped, but his words were steady. One student had to be taken to Recovery Girl for acid burns, but she kept saying that she would be fine. Eraser had had more serious injuries I noticed several broken bones, and the flesh around his arm looked, rotted away. Yeah, it was the villain in charge, Lamillion supplied. I saw that he could decay things when he put his whole hand on them. Any other injuries? Nejire Chan shook her head, though she wasn't nearly as energetic as before. Just some bumps and scrapes, nothing serious. What about you? Upon hearing that the other students would be fine, Lamillion relaxed, and his easy smile returned. Well, I think I pushed myself too far, but it doesn't feel like anything is broken this time. I definitely tore some muscles in my leg, though. Sun Eater sighed in relief. At least it's not serious, I'll take you to Recovery Girl, and Nejire Chan can help with the cleanup. He waved a finger under Lamillion's nose. No arguing about this, okay. Lamillion held up his hands in surrender. Okay, okay, let's go. Sun Eater put a hand on his arm to steady him, 
But as they passed Midoriya, Lemillion patted him on the shoulder. You did good, freshman. Seriously, you really went plus ultra back there. See you around. Midoriya blushed and nodded. When the older student left, he looked at Yuraraka, who had been waiting impatiently behind them with the rest of their friends. He opened his mouth to speak, but was cut off when the girl hugged him tightly. I'm so glad you're okay, Deku-kun. She pulled back and wiped her eyes. When I saw you fall into that portal, I thought anyway. You scared me again when All Might carried you outside. Don't do that again. I'll do my best, Midoriya promised tiredly, his mind too unfocused to register that he'd just received his first hug from a girl. Wait, I heard that Ashido was hurt? Is she okay? Yuraraka nodded. It looked bad. But she was telling jokes when the paramedics took her to recovery girl. I think she's gonna be okay. Midoriya sighed. That's good. And everyone else is fine. I think you and Ashido had the worst of it, Ida said as he limped over. Everyone else will likely recover on their own in a day or two. Now it was Midoriya's turn to wipe his eyes. That's, that's great to hear. He, Ida and Yuraraka all jumped when his watch beeped, and the dial turned green. Oh, good, it recharged. Then hurry up and transform, Yuraraka said, trying to sound stern, and failing miserably. Those burns look awful. Yeah, one second. Midoriya cycled through his transformations, and then pressed the dial. Swampfire. As Yuraraka watched, the charred parts of Swampfire's body turned to a vibrant green. However, uh, Deku-kun, I don't want to be rude, but that one smells really bad, Yuraraka said, holding her nose with one hand and trying to fan away the smell with the other. Asui wrinkled her nose. I didn't want to say anything on the boat, Midoriya, but she's right, Ribbit that smell is awful. All right, sorry. Midoriya quickly returned back to normal, and the smell faded. I bet Recovery Girl is happy that I don't have to see her, though, right? Asui nodded. Yeah, but poor Ashido is going to be with her, Ribbit. That's true, Ida said. As her friends, it would be uncouth of us not to check on her as soon as possible. Without his helmet, his wince was obvious. And I admit that I might have strained something as well, so I should probably see Recovery Girl. Oh, Ida, I'm so sorry. Yuraraka dashed over to him. Guys, come here and help me. Siro got to Ida's other side first, and between them, they supported the taller boy. Ida continued to protest. However, please, this is unnecessary. I can walk to recovery girl on my own. Yeyorazu smiled at him. Maybe, but you obviously caused yourself some strong discomfort in an effort to get help. Yeah, Midoriya walked over to the growing circle. If you hadn't found All Might in time, he might not have been able to save me. Ida shrugged modestly. Then it was obviously worth the pain. Regardless, Yeyurazu said, and her voice was a little stern now, we are going to help you get to Recovery Girl. Consider this an order from your class president. Ida probably knew she mostly meant it as a joke, but as soon as the words left her mouth, he straightened as much as he could. Of course, they'll head there now. Yeyurazu raised an eyebrow, and Ida winced again. With help, it's nice to see all of you leaning on each other like this, a new voice said. Midoriya turned to see a man in a beige coat and matching hat. Sorry, I'm Detective Tsukachi, and I'm heading the investigation into this attack. I don't want to stop you from seeing Recovery Girl, but if none of your injuries are critical, I'd like you all to give statements to the officers here before you leave. Yeyurazu bowed. Of course, Detective, it would be our pleasure. Tsukachi smiled. Thank you. Don't worry, this shouldn't take too long. For most of them, it didn't, only Midoriya took longer than a few minutes, since, among them, he'd had the most contact with the leader of the so-called League of Villains. He had to describe Shigaraki's quirk, his attitude, and any other detail he could. Thankfully, his analytical skills had their time to shine, and by the time he was done, Tsukachi looked impressed. That was very detailed, he said. I've met pro heroes who don't give reports that precise. It certainly cuts down on my work. Th thank you, sir. Midoriya frowned when a thought occurred to him. Um, detective. Yes, Midoriya-san. What is it? Are we in trouble? None of us have our licenses, but we used our quirks to fight villains. Tsukachi tilted his head for a moment and then smiled. Don't worry about it so much. From every report I've received, you only fought because your lives, and the lives of your classmates, were in danger. As long as it's proven to be self-defense, quirk use is allowed to fight someone else. Midoriya sighed in relief. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Just try not to get into situations that require self-defense, the detective warned, though he kept up his smile. At least until you get your license. Midoriya bowed. Of course, sir. 
Good, now you should catch up with your friends. Tsukachi pointed, and Midoriya saw Yuraraka waving him over. Don't worry about the rest, Midoriya-san. If we need anything else, we'll call you. Thank you. Midoriya bowed once more, and then jogged over to his friends. Most of the students were beginning to head to the locker rooms, but Minda stayed behind, waiting until the rest of the class was out of sight before approaching the principal. I can't do this, this was just too intense, he thought. I should just ask to transfer to general studies. Excuse me, Nezu-sensei. Nezu turned. What can I help you with, Minda-san? Minda opened his mouth, but then he looked at the retreating forms of Midoriya and his group of friends, and he thought back to when he was panicking in the water. Asui and Midoriya had been scared, just like him, but they hadn't freaked out. I guess I just know there's no point in panicking. I'm pretty sure that if I start panicking, I won't be able to stop. I'll freak out when we're not in danger. They were no different from him. They were both beginners, yet they had maintained their composure in the face of true terror. More than that, they had saved his life several times in just a few minutes. If he backed out now that would be spitting on their efforts. And he felt like he owed it to them to be better next time. Mind to Sam. Nezu tilted his head curiously. Is something the matter? Mind to shook his head. No, Nezu sensei. It's just that I got a good look at the villains in the shipwreck zone. If any of the police want to know any details, I might be able to help I know I can identify them. Anyway, Nezu smiled. Thank you, Minda-san, I'll be sure to let the police know. Minda smiled back. Maybe this is my first step. He isn't weak, Bakugo whispered. I hate that he's strong, but he is. What the hell happened? A year ago, he couldn't even look me in the eye, and now he's fighting villains that can beat pros. He was still coming to terms with the fact that Deku had a quirk at all. He was barely able to comprehend that the nerd had a powerful quirk. I have to get stronger, he thought fiercely. I've had my whole life to master my quirk, and that useless Deku managed to surpass me. But I can focus on just my quirk. That's the way I'll beat him. I'll show him and everyone else that quantity doesn't beat quality. Hey, Bakugo. He almost stumbled when the red-haired kid he supposed he owed it to him to learn his name, since he wasn't a half-bad fighter slapped him on the back. You good, bro? We all need to get out of our costumes and head home. Yeah, okay. Bakugo tried to look uncaring as he snuck a glance back at Deku and his worthless friends. Whatever. Hey, guys. Ashido smiled sleepily as her friends walked into the infirmary. What are you doing here? We came to see you, silly. Yuraka bounced over and gently hugged her. We weren't gonna leave you here by yourself. Aw, that's sweet, but I'm not by myself. She grinned at the two boys at the other side of the room and playfully swiped in their direction. Hey, good looking. Rower, Tagata seemed as tired as Ashido, but he laughed at her antics. Amajiki, on the other hand, pulled his hood further over his eyes in embarrassment. Looks like we're meeting again sooner than I thought, Tagata said with a friendly smile at Midoriya. You okay now? Uh, why yeah. One of my transformations lets me heal really quickly. Lucky you, Tagata teased. Recovery girl had to fix up torn muscles and a fracture in my left leg. Nothing too serious, I just have to rest for a few hours. I agree with her that you need to be more careful, Amajiki said with a frown. Your quirk was already hard to master, and now it's causing you physical damage if you push yourself too hard. Tagata nodded. I know, and that's why I'm being careful not to overdo it. He gave the other third year a confident smile. I promise, I'm doing everything I can to make sure I don't end up here more than I have to, but I'd rather suffer a small injury than let someone else die. Amajiki scowled. What I really hate is that I can't argue with that logic. He stood up and looked at the younger students. You know, none of us are supposed to stay in our costumes after lessons even when they end up like today did. If some of you would keep an eye on Mirio and your friend, we can take shifts getting changed. Tagata laughed. You make it sound like I'm gonna sneak out or something. I can take the first watch. Ada volunteered. I already need to see Recovery Girl, so I can handle it all at once. Everyone else can get changed, and then return here. Hey, yeah Momo, can you grab my uniform, and my costumes case? Ashido asked. Recovery Girl said I can get out of here in a couple of hours, but if I'm changed and have my costume put away, I don't have to go all over the place before going home. Yeyurazu smiled. Of course, Ashido. Come on, everyone, let's get changed before a teacher lectures us. It only took about 15 minutes for everyone to get changed and come back, though Midoriya had to drop off his costume with a note for the support department to repair his. He and Siro did decide to bring Ada's things as well, which he thanked them profusely for when they returned. When they opened the door again, they found Hato sitting next to Tagata, talking and waving excitedly. You kids are so fussy, recovery girl said as the younger students crowded around Nishido. She already has immunity to her acid, up to a point, between that and my quirk, she won't even have a scar. 
You're the best, recovery girl. Ashido smiled at the old lady. Ah, uh, I'm not finished. She waved her cane in the girl's face. You probably know this more than most, but acid can be especially damaging to the nerves. If you push your quirk beyond what you're capable of handling, you could lose your sense of touch completely and possibly functionality in your hands. Midoriya blanched, and he wasn't the only one. Even Hato's ever-present smile dimmed. Yeyarazu put her hand on Ishido's shoulder. Please, never push yourself that far. Siro nodded. Yeah, or you'll make Tsuyu sad. Tsuyu, give her your sad face. He gestured to Asui, whose expression never changed. See, it's like kicking a puppy. Ashido giggled. Okay, you're right, no making the best frog girl I know sad. I'm pretty sure I'm the only frog girl you know, Ribbit. You are, which automatically makes you the best. Ashido stuck out her tongue. In response, Asui reached out with her own tongue from five feet away and flicked Ashido between the eyes. Everyone stared at Asui as her tongue retracted. Her expression remained blank, but Midoriya was positive she was smug. Dang, Ashido said. With tongue action like that, you are gonna have one lucky boyfriend someday. Most of her classmates, even Asui, turned red, but the big three burst out laughing, or just smiling, in Amajiki's case. Oh, man, that was good. Tagata grinned at Ashido. You guys are great, we should hang out more. That would be a great honor, Mirio-san. Ida tried to bow, but since he was now lying on one of the cots, it just looked silly. Please, just Mirio is fine. He leaned back on his own bed and looked at his phone. Whoa, it's getting late. You all might want to consider getting home soon. None of the first years wanted to admit it, but they had trains to catch. On the other hand, they didn't want to leave their injured friends. Fortunately, Ida came to the rescue. I will be released at the same time as Ishido. I can keep her company until then, and I can also walk her to her train. I believe we both use the same station. Ashido blew him a kiss. My knight in futuristic armor. Ida sputtered and turned red, but the rest of them went right back to laughing. Midoriya wiped away a tear. If this was what he'd been missing out on for most of his life, he couldn't wait for more. Eventually, Izuku returned home, only to be nearly tackled as his mother ran into him. Oh, my baby, she cried. I know you texted me earlier, but then the police called, and your principal. I'm so glad you're not hurt. Izuku decided not to mention that he had been hurt a few times, but turning into swamp fire had fixed everything. And fine, mom, he said and hugged her back. A couple of my friends needed to get fixed up by recovery girl, but they should be on their way home by now. You should have seen this guy, Ben said as he materialized. He took down a bunch of the bad guys, including their heaviest hitter, saved two of his classmates from getting killed, and he didn't cry until everything was settled. Inko sniffed and wiped her eyes. I can't tell you how proud I am of you, Izuku, but please don't put me through that kind of stress until you've got at least a provisional license. Izuku nodded. I'll do my best, mom. You look exhausted, sweetie, Inko noted. I can heat some food up for you, but then I want you to get some sleep. Don't worry about waking up early when your principal called. He said that class was cancelled for tomorrow, and you've got the weekend. Take some time to process everything. Maybe talk to your new friends. And remember that you can talk to me, too. Izuku hugged her again. I'd never forget to talk to you, mom. I think I'll just get some sleep, though. Good night. Good night, Izuku. Inko watched as her son headed to his room, and then turned to Ben with a yawn. All this stress has me exhausted, and I didn't fight villains. I think I'll turn in early, too. Good night, Ben. Sleep well, Ben said. I'll keep an eye on everything, just in case. Inko turned and headed into her own room, just missing how Ben flickered erratically for a moment. Ben looked down at his hands and frowned. Already, I thought I'd have more time. He glanced back at Izuku's room. You're going to have to be ready soon, buddy, I'm not going to be around forever. Far from the Midoriya household, in a bar located away from any major streets, Shigaraki was throwing a fit, along with several chairs. Everything was ruined. He shouted. All our men were defeated. Namu was taken down by some kid, and All Might didn't even show up until we had no chance to beat him. He picked up a bar stool and hurled it into a wall. No way RNG screwed us over that bad, and our plan was good, so what the hell went wrong? If you will calm down for a moment, Tamura, came a calm, cultured voice, one that froze Shigaraki on the spot. The Namu I gave you is one of my most powerful creations. I crafted it to match All Might, so who was this student who defeated it? Shigaraki scowled behind the hand on his face, but turned and bowed to the small television in the corner, the source of the voice. No idea, master. He wore a green hoodie with stupid-looking ears. He turned into different forms, all with different quirks. One was a big dinosaur, another looked like it was made of diamond, and another shot fire so hot that it overwhelmed Namu's regeneration. 
Really? Now, far from being upset, Shigaraki's master sounded intrigued. Fascinating. I have not heard of someone with such vastly different quirks since well. We will have to keep an eye on this student. In fact, if mere students could defeat hardened villains like the ones who served you, then we should be wary of that entire class. For now, rest and heal, Tamura. Once you have recovered, we will begin learning what there is to know about these would-be heroes. You studied All Might in an effort to kill him. If these children are a threat to the League of Villains, then I suggest that you study them as well. Shigaraki bowed again. Of course, master, I was prepared for the boss of the raid, but I didn't take the minibosses seriously enough. I also should have considered random encounters. See, even though you failed to achieve your objective, you've learned something valuable. Thank you for your wisdom, master. Of course, Tamura, it is why I am here. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 3. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author The Incredible Muffin on fanfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.